Прийшли окупанти до нас в Україну, форма новенька воєнні машини, так трохи поплавився їх інвентар. Байрактар! Байрактар! Російські танкісти сховали з кущі, щоб лавтим посьорбати до паніщі, та трохи у чах перегрівся на бар. Байрактар! Великая страна. Доводи всяке озброєння, різне потужні ракети, машини залізні у нас на всі доводи є коментар. Байрактар. Байрактар. Вони захопити хотіли на зразу, а ми зачаїли на орків образу з російських бандитів. Робить примар. Байрактар. Байрактар Російська поліція справи заводить Там вивцю рашистів ніяк не знаходить Хто винен, що в нашому полі глухар Байрактар Байрактар Веде пропаганду кремлівський урод Слова пропаганди ковтає народ Тепер нове слово знає цар Байрактар 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 Oh. 
Hello, everyone. I'm the Enforcer, and I'm accompanied by Enforcer Matt. And good evening, folks. It's Enforcer Matt, and welcome back to day 758 of the news. And it's good to see you all once again. And today, Russia was attacked big league in Moscow, and there is complete chaos across the entire city. But it's good to see you all once again. And of course, we're going to be covering the past 24 hours of the news of the war in Ukraine, and also the news inside of the Russian Federation of the ongoing war there, and the uh, the extremist attack that has happened inside of the Moscow area within the Crocus City Hall um, uh, entertainment venue. We are going to be covering that news along with news that just came out nearly 10 minutes before the stream went live of further oil refinery attacks that have been occurring by Ukrainian forces, but today has been a massive day as far as news has been concerned. We have seen that one of the largest domestic terror attacks inside the Russian Federation over the course of nearly a decade and a half has occurred just today, and it appears that the Russian government is already looking at trying to find a way to blame this attack onto the Ukrainian nation, although the culprit has already made their public announcement that they were the ones responsible for the attack and are already saying that this is only the beginning. We're going to be moving on into that news immediately tonight, which brings us directly into the northwestern side of Moscow within one of the new developments that was just added to the city fairly recently within its history. Not too long ago, when the Soviet Union fell and the Western uh, countries were beginning to try and invest inside of Russia for economic ac ac um, opportunities, came the area of the Crocus City Hall, or more so, the Crocus Exposition Center. The Crocus Exposition Center is one of the largest ones inside of the city of Moscow and one of the biggest within the Russian Federation as well. Spanning an entire peninsula that sticks out into the Moskva River, this is truly one of the most premier entertainment venues and expo centers in the entirety of the city of Moscow and the Russian Federation. Just today, as a large crowd of people were gathering inside of Crocus City Hall, the music venue itself, and were uh, listening to some kind of music or some kind of an event or a concert, armed gunmen, nearly five in number from what we were able to tell, entered the building dressed in military camouflage, wielding AKMs and AK-74s, and began to open fire on anyone that they were able to find inside the building. At this very moment, the death toll is continuing to climb, but right now we understand that the death toll is nearly 60 and an untold number of wounded. It is probably the worst terrorist attack to have occurred inside of the Russian Federation since around 10 to 15 years ago, maybe ever since the Moscow apartment bombings of 1999. But I'm going to be bringing you all here to these clips because they are incredibly bizarre. We also have the report that uh, the ISIS group, because ISIS is the one who's actually claimed responsibility for this attack, uh, they had, there's around 60 dead. Keep Independent reported 40 dead. That was several hours ago. Now the number is as high as 60. But we're going to be moving over here to the videos that we have from the Crocus City Hall. And really quickly, before I even get into this, I have to make it quite clear to everyone that we cannot show some clips that we have gotten from Crocus City Hall here on air. YouTube has a policy where we cannot show things that are extremely graphic or extremely disturbing, and for that reason, we've had to heavily curate the films that we are going to be showing you all tonight that came from the Crocus City Hall attack. However, oh you man, and some of those some of those videos and images coming out of there are, are horrific, absolutely horrific images. A very big and bad terrorist attack indeed, uh, and the carnage is, is very big. It is in, it's terrible, and if y'all want to see it, which I'd recommend, honestly, that y'all do not take a look at it, but just in case if some of y'all are wondering what in the world does this attack really look like and how bad did it really get, we do have one clip right here that is an actual video uh, that was taken from the second floor looking down at the first floor of the venue uh, that shows some of the shooting unfolding, um, but we are not going to be showing that on air. Of course, you can see that right there that I have do not show on that. We will not be showing that because that would be against YouTube's policies. We can only show the videos that allow us to hear the sounds of gunfire, but we can't show anything that's blatantly graphic. But moving into our first clip we got to see uh some of the shooting that was happening inside of the building right here this was posted on twitter by live ua map and our two videos that were filmed from inside of the actual concert hall uh where you could hear the shooters moving on their way into this area and firing uh as they walked through the lobby and to the concert hall here is this clip we can hear rifle fire as many of the people here are trying to run out as fast as possible Thank <laughs> you. 
We see people continuing trying to evacuate out of the concert hall and through the curtains that are in front of the concert hall. The rifle fire is continuing to grow louder as the gunmen walk their way through the lobby and towards the actual concert hall. This footage right here is actually taken from the lobby at the exact same time as the other film was being made uh, and lets us hear the gunmen actually traveling their way through the lobby and into the concert hall, which was their final destination. We can hear a mix of semi-automatic and full-automatic rifle fire coming from the gunmen. We do understand that there was nearly five armed gunmen that were involved in this shooting. We can see citizens running around inside of the concert hall trying to find a way out. You can see with the venue worker here that was filming the clip now trying to move around and possibly make his way out of the building as well. This are these are the two clips uh, that we can show of the shooting inside of the lobby and the concert hall. We also have one right here, an additional one that I was able to find that shows the gunmen inside of the concert hall once they finally made it to the area and continuing to open fire into the general area. This is not a graphic clip. I have to make that quite clear because I want you to know if something's graphic or not, and we're not showing anything graphic tonight. This one isn't graphic. The cameraman zoomed in on the gunmen, and we can only see them down there at the very bottom tier of the concert hall firing, but once again giving us uh, the best look that we could possibly get from this terrorist attack that occurred. When you see the gunman right down there. And I'd also like y'all to note, really quickly, now that we got a close-up view, that this is a very coordinated group of gunmen that attacked the Crocus City Hall building. We can see four out of the five of them right here in this clip. Uh, all of them appear to have bulletproof vests, appear to be wearing maybe even military uh, shirts below that. Uh, it doesn't appear that many of them have helmets, or if any of them have helmets, but we can also see that they're all equipped with some version of an AKM or an AK-74. These guys are very very kitted. I mean, they are well kitted for what we would consider to be uh, a terrorist organization, considering that ISIS took blame for this, or at least took public credit for the attack. But they are oddly very well equipped, even compared to ISIS fighters that we would have seen in the peak of the 2010s when ISIS was at its strongest inside the Middle East, controlling massive swaths of Iraq and Syria. Not even a lot of those soldiers were as equipped as these gunmen are inside of this clip. So this seems to be a little odd. I'll just put that out there at the moment. You see the gunmen continuing to remain organized in a small group when the video clip ends, once again showing the high coordination and organization that these gunmen had, possibly suggesting that they have a high level of training and have had this in planning for months, if not over a year at this point. This is giving us a very... Also, also, I find it kind of odd that the cameraman in this photo here, or in this picture, they didn't seem to react very much when they were filming this entire thing. They kind of kept the camera very steady the whole time, and they really weren't phased by the fact that the guy was literally aiming up and, and firing at people that they could see around the area. Uh, but the cameraman has stayed perfectly still. Yeah, it is uh, incredibly bizarre. It is, it is wildly bizarre how this film was made. And really quickly, I'm going to kind of hop forward to why I'm saying all of this is quite bizarre. I am kind of on the fence as to whether these are really ISIS terrorists here that conducted this attack or whether it's a false flag. Because many people have been suggesting that this was a false flag attack that the Russian Federation tried to propagate today to possibly try and escalate the war with Ukraine further or a conflict with the West further down the line and try and justify any escalations through this attack that occurred on Crocus. Crocus is one of the most premier expo venues and concert halls in the entirety of the city of Moscow and because of that throughout all of Russia. The fact that this attack occurred has caused such a high amount of casualties and is right at the cusp of the Ukrainians attacking Russian oil refineries and not only that, uh, the, uh, the Russians launching an attack on return to the Ukrainians and knocking out vital uh, infrastructure such as the Dnipro Dam just yesterday, which we'll be getting to here in a moment, this appears to me to possibly be some kind of an attempt at a false flag. Uh, and 
And another thing that I like to note is that I've seen a lot more video clips that unfortunately I cannot show here on air. And they show a much higher level of coordination than we've ever seen from ISIS fighters in any other instance inside the Middle East, or even ISIS fighters that have engaged the FSB inside the Russian Federation in years prior. None of them have operated as uh, coordinated and as perfectly as these guys did. This is very similar to how a Russian infantry squad or an FSB unit would operate during something like the Beslan school shooting that occurred inside of Russia as well, or more so the Beslan school bombing, uh, whichever way you want to call it where the FS, well, actually the KGB or the FSB, as you want to call it, ended up uh, producing a mass casualty uh, event by pumping in uh, poison gas into the building and pretty much killing everyone inside, including the school children that they were trying to rescue. This seems to be something that looks very similar to those kinds of attacks, or at least the kinds of tactics and strategies that the Russian Federation would train their FSB operators to use. Uh, but moving on from that clip, Right after the gunmen began to enter the building and open fire, a fire, a literal fire, began to erupt out of the roof of the building. We're not exactly sure what the origins of this fire are or why it started, but we can already see that it is engulfing most of the expo center and beginning to eat it up with the flames from within. That's the end of that clip right there, and we're going to be moving on into our next clip of the fire, where we can once again see that the fire is beginning to rage quite strongly and start consuming the roof of the building. And also, you know, to my knowledge, they haven't been able to put this fire out yet. Like, they've br they brought in aircraft to drop water on the building. Uh, they've got, obviously brought the firefighters in, for sure, and there's nothing they can do to put it out. It seems like the fire is going to rage on. It does seem like the fire is most likely going to rage on until it completely destroys the building. And another thing that I'd like to circle back to, and this is something that some people touched on in the live chat that is uh, describing this much better than I can. Some people have been able to get closer up pictures of these gunmen that were inside of Crocus City Hall and look at the kit that they had. Some of them, I believe one or two of them, actually had AK-12s with customized furniture. The AK-12 is a rifle that has never been exported, from my knowledge, outside of the Russian Federation. The AK-12 is entirely an indigenous Russian rifle at the moment that is not used by anyone but the Russian Federation. Um, and I can see here, and that is exactly what we're getting from uh, Wikipedia as well, at least according to public information, is that the AK-12 is not used by anyone but the Russian Armed Forces and the FSB. Really, any kind of Russian Armed Force, they are using the AK-12. The fact that these guns are the ones that the gunmen were equipped with, out of five of them, two of them had AK-12s from what we're seeing, that is once again backing up the idea that this is most likely some kind of a false flag being propagated by the Russian Federation, because where in the world is an ISIS fighter going to get an AK-12? They're not getting those in the middle of the Middle East or the Caucasus Mountain region where they base their operations out of inside of Russia. They're not getting it from those areas. They're getting them from the Russian Federation itself, from the Russian military. And that's something that, once again, is starting to further the concept that these guys are not necessarily ISIS guys. They may be um, Russian false flag guys that are posing as ISIS operatives. But moving on from that and into our next clips of the fires that were beginning to rage around the building, we can see that the building in this closer-up film had already begun, uh, begun to be engulfed in flames, and a large amount of Russian fire brigades had moved into the area, but they were not able to quell the fire, and the fire continued to burn out of control. That's the end of the clip right there, but once again showing the fire continuing to burn, and as Matthew said, uh, water aircraft have been brought in, along with as many fire brigades as can possibly be mobilized, and it still seems that there is absolutely no end to this fire. It will most likely burn down this entire side of the uh, Expo Center, uh, Crocus City Hall right here, which is the actual music venue that we saw the shooting occur in, and maybe even the Planet Tanisa uh, part of the Expo Center that is directly south of the Crocus Congress, uh, the Crocus uh, City Hall. I don't know why in the world they called it the City Hall because earlier in the day this caused a lot of confusion on my end as I was looking for an actual City Hall building for this part of Moscow and not a music venue. But nevertheless, this terrorist attack, this extremist attack more so, is seeming to be 
very interesting to me. And it looks like a lot of y'all have many different opinions on who it is. Some people are saying that it's certainly not a false flag. Some people are saying that it certainly is ISIS. And while I've largely been of the mindset that this is most likely some kind of a false flag attack or uh, something along those lines, there is an equal argument to be made that this is ISIS-K activity. ISIS-K has been operating inside of Russia for a very long time at this point and has continued to operate even into the modern day, although hibernating and pretty much going dormant for the most part, very rarely uh, conducting terrorist attacks inside of the Russian Federation and also causing any kind of damage. It's pretty much non-existent. Um, but nevertheless, many people have had many different opinions, and it looks like a lot of people are of one of two ideas. But Matthew, what do you think about this attack? Who do you think actually did it? And most importantly, what is everyone else thinking about the attack as well? All right, so we asked all of you in the audience, who do you think is really behind the Moscow attack? 43% uh, says it is ISIS-K terrorists. 34% said it's the Russian FSB conducting a false flag. And 19% said unsure, and only a mere 4% said a Western government. And in my opinion... I am really honestly leaning toward is a Russian FSB false flag. I don't have enough evidence. Nobody really does at the moment to say that for certain, but I'm leaning toward that direction. Uh, but officially speaking, the Western government in the United States has said that it is ISIS-K, and they've confirmed through their intelligence that it was them. And also, we did allegedly see an ISIS-K uh, social media account come out and take credit for the attack as well, which seemed to solidify uh, that conclusion by the American CIA. The only catch, though, is to me, is it seems a little bit odd uh, that Russia completely ignored the warnings that the United States gave to them two weeks prior to this attack happening uh, that something like this was going to occur. Russia completely ignored it, um, and these guys came in and caused some devastation uh, in that Crocus Arena. So I'm a little bit on the fence, but Enforcer, what say you? I would have to say... Now, really quickly before I get into this, I see that a lot of people are of different um, different ideas. A lot of people are thinking that uh, it is uh, purely an ISIS-K attack and it can only be an ISIS-K attack. And some people are thinking that it can only be a false flag from the FSB or some other group and that's the only way it could be. The honest answer is, is that while I'm fairly certain of my opinion... It's only an opinion. It's not a fact. We don't know who it really was. It could have been the FSB. It could have been ISIS-K. ISIS-K, at least on Twitter, has come out and claimed that they were the ones who conducted this attack. But in reality, you know, not to, not to try and continue the argument here, but in the reality, the Russian government could have made an ISIS-K account and then put out this information saying that ISIS-K conducted the attack. It could be anything for that matter. And one thing I'd also like to say is that uh, ISIS-K, and, and this is something I haven't really talked about a lot before on the channel, but it's a little bit difficult to talk about uh, diplomacy and geopolitical affairs uh, and try and keep everything uh, in a clear good and evil side because there's a lot of gray area. The Ingushetian Liberation Army and Ingushetia that we've covered before on this channel actually has a pretty decent connection to ISIS-K in the area. They both have a very similar flag to each other. We do understand that there may be some kind of a coordination there where ISIS-K or the Ingushetian Liberation Army provides arms to one or the other, and they may even be coordinating efforts in the area to a slight degree, at least from the rumors that we've heard in that region. Going off of that, it's not out of the question that this attack is more so of an FSB attack, because... If that is the case, even if there is a limited num uh, limited amount of, of involvement in between the Ingushetian Liberation Army and the ISIS-K people inside of the Caucasus region, that can give the Russians the ability to create a false flag out of the situation and then blame it on Ukraine. Because if anyone does not know, the Ingushetian Liberation Army inside the Caucasus region in Ingushetia is actually was actually created in the middle part of 2023 by a Ukrainian member of the Verkona Rada, which is the Ukrainian parliament, and therefore is supplied and kind of funded in a small way by the actual Ukrainian government. So it's a quasi-pro-Ukrainian organization in a way. If there is any kind of connection in between that group right there and ISIS-K, or the Russians can try and make an attachment which may be the way they explain away those AK-12s. They could say, the Ukrainians captured these AK-12s in Ukraine, sent them to the Ingushetian Liberation Army, and then the Ingushetian Liberation Army moved these to ISIS-K, and then ISIS-K used them in this attack. Therefore, Ukraine is sponsoring terrorist attacks on the Russian Federation, and we need to escalate our response even further by some kind of a mobilization or something like that. 
It could be something along those lines. It takes a lot of dot connecting to do something like that at the moment. So I would actually have to say, at on face value, it's most likely an ISIS-K attack. But there's something in the back of my head at the moment, and we'll only be able to see over the next few days, that tells me that the Russians are going to try and spin this into some kind of a false flag so that way they can justify further actions or further escalations against Ukraine and against the rest uh, the rest of the Western world. Uh, it's also, uh, also Enforcer, one more thing that sort of makes me lean toward the false flag argument, Like, and we have to make this perfectly clear like the Enforcer said, there is no concrete evidence to prove yet this is a false flag attack. So when I say this, it is simply my opinion. Um, but the fact that Medvedev came out so quickly and pinned it on Ukraine and said, if we get the exact link we need to link the Ukrainians to it, we're going to hunt them all down and kill them. Then you had several members and senators of the Russian state Duma come out and say that Ukraine had a connection to it. You had them trying to push this narrative as well, that there was a white van outside of the arena itself with Ukrainian license plates on it. There were so many different little things piling up to try to link Ukraine to it. And that's sort of what gives me the suspicion to think that maybe this was a false flag attack and maybe they're having a hard time actually pinning it on Ukraine. Uh, it could be simply a failure of the FSB's operation. But to me, I would not put it past Russia to do something as sick as to go in and kill their own civilians to justify a larger mobilization. That, to me, seems like it could be very likely because they're a very sick regime in Russia and they don't take civilians into account whatsoever. So I, I can't rule that out. And another thing that I'd also like to point out is that the city of Moscow is a, is a federal city inside the Russian Federation. That means that this is pretty, this literally is the center of power within Russia. And even inside the inner areas of Moscow and even out into these further suburbs, there is a massive amount of security that is always present by Russian police and FSB forces. There are endless amounts of checkpoints that are set up, just, you know, flash checkpoints that the Russians set up throughout all of Moscow every single day, every single week, in wartime and out of wartime. And there's always an endless amount of security, uh, Russian armed security, wherever larger venues are, where the wealthier people of the Russian Federation may end up hanging out. And the Crocus City Hall area is one of those places. It's a little bit odd to me that gunmen were able to drive up to the building, get out of the van, and then go in the building and conduct a massive shooting spree without any of these Russian armed police or security being seen anywhere. It is a little bit odd to me. Maybe the, maybe the Crocus uh, City Hall area was picked for the attack because there was a blatant lack of security. Who knows? But nevertheless, it does seem a little bit odd because one thing's always been for certain, Moscow is usually, at least on a terroristic level, heavily heavily locked down almost all the time. Uh, on a military level, like dealing with the Wagner coup or dealing with anything else, uh, like a drone attack, it isn't that well protected. But on a terroristic level like this attack we saw today, they're usually fairly well protected, and there was barely response at all to be made to this attack. FS, like The FSB is headquartered out of Moscow. That's where most FSB operatives are at any given moment or inside of the city of Moscow. 10% of the Russian Federation lives here, and it's a little bit bizarre to me to believe that none of them were around the area of Crocus City Hall while a massive event was going on and the Russian government had already been tipped off by the United States government that there was most likely an impending terroristic attack that was going to be occurring somewhere inside of Moscow or St. Petersburg. So it seems a little bit odd, and I'm not saying that, you know, everyone who said it's ISIS-K is wrong. I mean, y'all y'all are probably right in reality. You know, it's, it's uh, it seems to me, even right now, trying to argue that it is a false way, it might be a bit of a stretch. I'm not, again, saying that I could be wrong on that. But it all seems a little bit odd how all of this came in and lined up as almost a, a complete coincidence that could lead to one of the most devastating domestic terror attacks on the Russian Federation for quite some time. Um, but... Moving on from that, now that we've kind of covered most of the, well, we have covered all of the news that we have that we can show on air tonight about the Crocus City Hall attack, it's time for us to move on to an attack that occurred literally just 40 minutes ago here on air. Um, this is the town of Samara. Samara is one of the towns that uh, borders the Volga River, the longest and largest river within all of Europe. This town here is home, like many other Russian um, cities that we cover on this channel, to a large refinery, which you can see right here. Actually, let me make sure, let me double check that that is the refinery in the area. Wait, never mind, scratch that, here's a refinery in the area. Sorry, that's actually the metallurgical plant. Um, but beyond that, this is the oil refinery that is in the city of Samara. 
The city of Samara just came under attack nearly 30 minutes ago, and a massive fire has already erupted in this oil refinery, shutting the entire refinery down and making sure that it is completely unusable into the foreseeable future. Another successful Ukrainian drone attack has occurred and knocked out an entire Russian oil refinery offline again. We don't even know what percentage this is actually accounting for with this attack that has been knocked out, but it is another fairly impressive Ukrainian attack, especially considering the range in which Samara is from Ukraine. The closest distance launch-wise from Ukraine to Samara is a whopping 590 miles, making this the longest range drone attack to have ever occurred in the history of the wars so far. But we also have additional videos from Samara showing the attack that occurred on the refinery and the fire that began to erupt as a result. Here's the first clip showing the fire. We see the fire continue. The Ukrainians are getting pretty, they are getting pretty, like, uh, pretty dead accurate with these uh, shots at the oil refineries. And also the timing on this, with it happening right after that terrorist attack in Moscow, I wonder if that's going to have any different uh, significance to it now that that attack just occurred. And also Ukraine's continuing to attack uh, Russia's main infrastructure, which is the oil refineries. Yeah, um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting correlation. We can already see one... Russian bot, I'd assume, making a comment on that on the heels of an attack on innocence at a concert hall, and they want us to believe this isn't all connected. You can already see that a certain story is trying to be spun out of this whole deal, and the Russians are probably going to attempt to spin it that way on an official level. But here's another video showing the fireball that has erupted out of the Samara oil refinery after the attack. Here is our picture, our next picture of the oil refinery getting hit. That appears to be the actual initial explosion that led to the fireball. And then we see the fireball continuing to burn on into the morning hour, uh, which was just about 40 minutes ago. But still showing that the Ukrainians are conducting the longest range attacks of the war on serious Russian oil infrastructure. And once again, knocking out their ability to produce oil and therefore continue on this war. Ironically, this came right after a statement was sent out or made public by the U.S. government where the U.S. government has asked that the Ukrainians stop their attacks on oil refineries inside the Russian Federation because the rising prices of oil may impact American domestic elections being held inside the United States. So the Ukrainians should revolve their entire war around U.S. domestic politics. Um, something that is pretty interesting to hear is an actual statement that came out and has been confirmed to be true. Now, of course, really quickly, I have to make sure that uh, I, I walk on eggshells here because this channel has a specific policy where we do not talk about domestic politics and we also do not pick a side. But I will say this. I'm generally against the United States trying to tie the Ukraine war to domestic political issues, uh, especially even if it does affect an election in the United States that is completely beyond Ukraine's concern. They are fighting a full-on war inside of their own territory, and anything that gives them the upper hand, they ought to go after. Attacking Russian oil refineries is one of those things. I think that it is very short-sighted of really any group in the United States uh, to try and start tying the Ukraine war to the domestic political issues, whether it be other domestic affairs in the United States, such as different kinds of policies, or whether it's to tie it to a uh, national election. It seems a little bit bizarre to me that the United States should be, in one way or another, trying to tie the war in Ukraine to domestic American matters, whether it be an election or a policy for some reason. It's it's incredibly bizarre to me. And I got to say that I, I don't really like that because this isn't the first time we've seen this. This is the second time. There was a time earlier, um, which we, of course, did not cover on this channel. And now there's this as well, which we're not going to cover in depth on this channel and pick any partisan side. But I find it absolutely distasteful that the United States prioritizes domestic political issues over geopolitical issues of national security concern. And not only that, European national security concern, which is a massive interest that the United States has. Very odd. It, to seems, see. it seems like if we don't want uh, Ukraine striking Russian oil industries, we should maybe speed up our weapon shipments and pass some aid for Ukraine to get that to them faster. So that way they, they could simply drive the Russians out of their country. But, you know, we're going to ask them not to attack the Russians, and we're not going to give them any aid, then we're not going to give them any weapons, and then we're going to be angry with Ukraine. That makes no sense. 
yeah, it's a, it's a little weird. It's a little weird. But moving on from that and out of the United States, it's time for us to move on back into Ukraine because, believe it or not, we still have hardly uh, touched on any of the breaking news today. The entire night is a breaking news night. There's just an endless amount of it. Uh, and also, I got to say, the chat is going freaking wild. I don't know what it is tonight, but the chat has been going at nearly... Uh, three chats a second. Um, so at this rate, we're firing about the speed of a very, very slow firing machine gun right now in the live chat, just in the amount of chats that are coming in. Really crazy. It's rolling, to see man. That. It's, it's hard to read them all, man. It's, it's so hard to keep up. It's, it's really wild to see. And I also have to let you all know, this is going to be at Matthew's discretion as the stream goes on. But to make sure that we can control the live chat, we may actually have to put a, uh, a a slow chat mode on of some kind so that we can make sure to moderate the live chat and keep it under control. Because right now, there are so many live chats coming in. It is insane. I mean, there's literally an endless amount of them. I can't even read all of them. Because when I try and look at one to read it, it's already off the screen. Uh, so I, I have to say this, though. That is not a bad thing. We highly encourage you all to speak y'all's minds and talk about whatever y'all want to talk about uh, inside of, of the live chat. But I also have to put, uh, keep y'all on notice that if it keeps up the speed and it goes crazy, we may actually have to start slowing the live chat. But moving on with from that... And into the Russian Federation, we have begun to hear that apparently, and this is another reason why, and I'll quickly explain something that I didn't explain uh, earlier. The reason why I believe that the attack on the Crocus City Hall may have been a false flag is because we also got news today from the Kiev Independent saying that the Russians are planning on building a brand new 100,000 man strong force, possibly for a summer offensive in Ukraine. And they say that they're creating a brand new force of 100,000 soldiers to try and conduct this offensive in the early summer. Now, this is a little bit interesting because we know that the Russians are woefully under, underpowered, undermanned as far as it goes, and they need more men. And what better way to justify a call for more men than a terrorist attack occurring in northwestern Moscow that would lead the Russian government to have an excuse to start getting a lot more heavy-handed with this war on a public level and say that it's the duty of the Russian government and the Russian people to uh, sign up or to be conscripted and fight against Ukraine because they're the true evil guys. And that's kind of the thing that I'm seeing at the moment because it's interesting to see that that statement is made along with the terrorist attack that happened today. Those two things seem to be fairly aligned with each other and one could be used to justify the other. That's kind of what I'm seeing at the moment, but let me know what y'all think in the live chat, uh, because many of y'all are, <laughs> because the 250 of y'all have in the last minute. But with that, it's time for us to move on out of the area of that little bit of news and on to the city of Belgrade, as rocket attacks continue to occur today on Belgrade, and we were able to see continued explosions occurring throughout the city. Here are multiple different uh, security camera films showing these explosions. Our first one here shows a Russian citizen running into his crew, uh, his commie block to hide from the rocket barrage. And we can see it start right over here where the mouse cursor is. You'll see the first boom right there. The second one in the parking lot right there. And then the third one right here near this car. The Free Russian Army is just bombarding the city of Belgorod with MLRS barrages. They seem to be fairly inaccurate, uh, and we're not really seeing if there's any proof that they're actually causing any damage to Russian armed forces. Or any Russian border guards, for that matter, either. Can you imagine how Putin really must be feeling right now? Because you've got Belgrade under attack, so the rebels are attacking in that region of Russia. Then you have a massive terrorist attack in Moscow. And then you have all these issues just popping up all over the place. A fire starting in random places. you got the Ukrainians striking oil refineries all over the country. You know, if I was in his shoes right now, I would be in a sheer panic. And I would have to say that... I agree. It, it's pretty much sheer panic at this point. And I'm trying, Matthew, at the same time to read the live chat. Uh, let's see. And and Don, see, how do you read the chat and uh, host at the same time? At this point, I don't. Because there's so many of them coming in, I really can't do that. Uh, but moving on into our last clip, we can also see a fire that's enveloping the city of Belgorod. But it is, like Matthew said, raw chaos. And the Russians are probably panicking on every level because, really, the alarm bells are going off everywhere. Literally all the way from Moscow and all the way down into Belgorod and even into Ukraine as the Russian armed forces continue to pretty much be uh, fighting in mud or trying to climb uh, up a hill covered in mud against the Ukrainian armed forces, which are still holding their ground incredibly well. 
Moving on from that and into our next clip, we also got to see that there is a continued presence of the Free Russian Army inside of the Belgrad region, as we got a picture today of a Free Russian soldier uh, putting his thumbs up as he's sitting inside of the uh, Sveyat, or the Gyat Forest in the Belgrad region. Very nice to see that he's still there, and they're still doing their thing. You know, the Free Russian Army is a pretty impressive group through and through. I got a lot of respect for him. But moving on from that and out of this little area, it's time for us to move on into even more breaking news as we see that the Free Russian Army is still holding their ground inside of the Belgorod region and continuing to inflict a pretty decent amount of casualties and hold a decent amount of ground to the Russian Federation at the exact same time that we're seeing the Ukrainians attack major oil refineries still. At the exact same time, there's a large terrorist attack that happened in Moscow. At the exact same time as all of this and the United States saying uh, some interesting things, we got to see that one of the largest attacks uh, that has ever occurred on Ukraine by missile forces occurred tonight. Well, actually last night, about 23 hours ago. It occurred 23 hours ago, and it was one of the largest attacks that ever occurred. The Ukrainian air defense did the best they could in attempting to shoot down and intercept as many of these missiles and weapons as possible. Um, but it appears that... They didn't get all of them, and we'll be going to the one place where they certainly didn't get the one that really counted the most. But we're going to be going up here into the Kiev area and showing y'all a clip of a L3 Harris Vampire air defense system shooting down a Russian Shahed drone. You see a fire right there, and there goes the missile, hitting the Shahed dead on and taking it down immediately. We well, hear more ground fire uh, outside of the L3 Harris Vampire. And the Shahed crashes into the Sea of Kiev, just north of the city. This is a duplicate clip, um, unfortunately, so it's the exact same thing. Shahed spirals into the sea, and that's the end of that clip. But moving on from that and into our next one, we were also able to see that the Ukrainians were able to shoot down an incoming missile with a man pad of a sort. Uh, this, here's a clip. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything anymore. Here's a clip. See the missile fired. Missile on its way. Missile hits the target. Taking it down. Yes! 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 <laughs> Huge shout out to the Presidential Brigade, by the way, who has been moved back into Kiev to defend the area around Kiev, where the president actually is. But moving on from that and into our next clip, we also saw, well, we didn't really see it, but we more so got to hear the sound of a, of a Kinzel missile flying over. From what I understand, this is the first time that the sound of the Kinzel has actually ever been recorded. Uh, so this is, a, this is pretty much a first as far as the war has ever gone. I've never heard of Kinzel before myself so maybe a lot of y'all haven't so i'm just gonna let the uh, video play i'm not gonna talk over it and just let y'all hear what i would say is the haunting sound of the kinzel it's actually a very odd sound but here's the clip Wow, that Kenzel sound really is uh, ominous. It is. It sounds like an air raid siren nearly. Very, very haunting. But nevertheless, we finally got to hear the sound of what a Kenzel sounds like flying over. Also, by the way, you might find this really interesting. Yeah, we shouldn't be able to hear the Kenzel, just putting that out there. Um, the Kenzel, if it was a true hypersonic, should be supersonic all the way up to hitting its target. Uh, the fact that we're able to hear this thing before it flies over, flying over and then past us, shows us that by the time it's actually moving into the area of Kiev, it is now nearly subsonic, or actually subsonic, because we can actually hear the missile coming and then fly over. So, it's moving fast, it's probably moving close to the speed of sound, but it's not moving at Mach 5 or Mach 7 or anything like that. Because if it was moving that fast, you wouldn't hear it. You would just hear, and then you would finally hear the sound just right after that. And we didn't hear anything along those lines. Because you would hear the sonic boom, 
this would be traveling faster than the speed of sound, so all the sound would pretty much compress into this one spot, which is what creates that massive loud boom that is caused when anything goes faster than the speed of sound. But moving on from that little clip right there, we did get to get an air defense report telling us everything that the Ukrainians were able to shoot down, and it was one hell of a list. They were able to shoot down 35 X-101 and X-555 uh, missiles. They were also able to shoot down 55 Shahed 136s, and also two X-59 guided air missiles. It was a very successful night for the Ukrainian air defense, but while these numbers are huge, unfortunately, they only shot down around 70% of all incoming Russian air targets. Um, beyond that, they were not able to destroy any further ones, and uh, nevertheless, we got to see that there was some serious damage, and that's what we're going to be moving down. I'm not going to be showing you all the damage that occurred across Ukraine. There was some significant damage to Kharkiv, Kiev, and uh, many other major cities, but... Moving on down to the Zaporizhia area, this is where the missile impact was probably the most severe. Many of y'all know that we actually covered this while we were on air last night, at least a small amount before we got off air, but the Dnipropetrovsk Dam inside the city of Zaporizhia is one of the oldest ones in Ukraine and is also one of the largest in terms of power production ability. This dam has been blown up by the Soviet Union in their retreat from Ukraine in 1941, and it appears that the Russian Federation attempted to blow it up again today, sending a X-155 missile directly into the upper part of the dam and blowing up an area somewhere around this part right here where the mouse cursor is moving. I'll be showing you all the clip um, because it is very interesting to see the dam get attacked and hit by a missile. Actually, sorry, that's the wrong post. Let me make sure to get you all to the one where we can see the actual missile flying over. And let me see. Oh, here we go. This is it right here. So this is a video film directly from the base of the uh, of the Dnipropetrovsk Dam to show y'all exactly where this is. It is around this area. Oh, let me make sure. Let me make sure because I had this geo located earlier. I just want to double check, and it appears that my double check is correct. From what we understand, this video was filmed somewhere around right here on this little uh, island here, in between the two locks that allow ships to go uh, upstream and downstream. It was filmed somewhere around here because we can see the very back of the dam right here at the latter part of the clip. So I'm going to show you all the film, but this is the perspective it's filmed from, just to let you all know where the video is. But here's the clip. And there's the missile. And that's the end. Do we know what kind of missile that was? Did you, did you say that? That was an X-155 from what I was able to find. And let me make sure to pull up a picture of that. Um, and not the guitar, the missile. Oh, <laughs> civil, civil goods. Goodness gracious. Let's see. Here we go. Here it is. Oh, uh, we understand it to be this missile right here. Um, this X-55 or the KH-55. Uh -huh. Aha, and, and what kind of yield does this thing have on it? Do you I, know? Think, I think it's fairly large. Uh, let me check. Um, let's see here. The blast yield. Uh, well, we're not wanting to kill the nuclear yield. We're just wanting the conventional yield. And let's see here. Uh, let's see. Can carry a nuclear warhead? Yeah, but it's not. So what's the actual yield? Uh, sadly, I cannot find one because it only says thermonuclear or conventional warhead, but it doesn't actually give us an idea of how big the conventional warhead is. I would assume it's probably around a Fab 500 in size, uh, as far as explosive yield goes. So close to a 1,000 pound bomb, most likely. Yeah, that's a pretty big one to knock out that much of the dam for sure. And let's see here. I'm trying to look around. Let me, let's see. Uh, with a warhead weight, actually, it's a very small warhead. It's a warhead weight of 290 pounds, so it's like a 300-pound bomb hitting the bridge. Oh, well, hitting the dam or so. Uh-huh. Well, that caused a lot of damage for that, then. Yeah, it's, it's quite, <laughs> quite so. Uh, we can actually see the electrical station caught on fire at the bottom of the dam. Uh, Ukrainian firefighters have been trying to deal with that all the way through today. It appears that the fire has been very difficult to control. Uh, and we also have a video clip that came from that um, electrical station that we just saw in that picture right there. Here we can see the Ukrainian firefighters trying to fight the blaze inside of the building. When you see that the roof has suffered some very severe damage and the power producing elements have also produced, uh, well, have, has had serious damage as well. And also I see Tom Xman in the chat saying, didn't, uh, didn't this end up cutting off the ZNPP, uh, from the lines? 
And I did see reports of that last night. I'm not sure if the enforcer has that in the news lineup or not, but um, I'm not really sure. It kind of went quiet in the news from what I could tell about that. Uh, yes, the ZMPP, uh, well, not the ZMPP, I believe the uh, the Dnipro-Trofs Dam is currently offline. I don't think the ZMPP is offline at the moment from what I could find. Uh, but moving on from that, we could also see once again that the key post put out a post talking about the Major Dam being attacked. I showed that one earlier, just want to make sure to cover it again to touch all bases. And we also got to see, and let me make sure that we get this, uh, the fire burning on the dam. Apparently something caught on fire near the bridge level. We were able to see this in this clip today. Here's the clip. Ну что, Русня поздравила с добрым утром, да? Я думал, это сон сквозь сон. Actually, it appears to be some kind of a gas line that may have been ruptured and caught on fire. It looks to be maybe this yellow kind of a pipe structure that's moving along the back of the dam. Света в районе нету. Это называется всем доброе утро. That's seen in the clip right there, but still showing the damage to the uh, Dnipropetrovsk or the Dnipro hydroelectric station. Well, that those that's the end of all the news that we have right there in the Dnipropetrovsk Dam area or within the city of Zaporizhia. And it's time for us to move on back out of this area and up north and on to the location unknowns, getting on into the rest of the breaking news that we have for the rest of the night. But... Many people have been talking about the Moscow attack. The Moscow attack has been really the main point of discussion in the live chat tonight, and it is something worth talking about. Um, the attack has been something that has really concerned a lot of people today. A lot of people have thought that the Russians are going to take this and run with it to try and blame something on Ukraine and then use it to escalate the war even further with them, maybe even to start a mass mobilization or a conscription. Uh, and it seems as though a lot of people are thinking that although ISIS-K has officially come out and claimed that they were the ones behind the attack, the Russians are going to try and blame Ukraine anyways. And it seems as though that is something that many people agree with. Almost everyone here agrees with that. But Matthew, what do you think about that? And most importantly, what are what is everyone else thinking about that kind of an idea? All right. So we asked everyone in the audience. We said Ukraine has disavowed any involvement in the Moscow attack. And assuming for purposes of this poll that this is not a false flag attack by Russia, do you think Russia is going to blame Ukraine anyway? 71%, an overwhelming majority, said yes, they will blame them anyway. 12% said only time will tell. 8% said no, Russia doesn't have enough ev uh, evidence of that. And I will say that no time in the past has a lack of evidence ever prevented Russia from trying to pin something on Ukraine that was uh, wrongfully pinned on them. So I'm going to say that Russia is going to try to blame them anyway, even if there isn't enough evidence, uh, because and that would allow Putin to justify a further escalation of the war, which is uh, what I believe personally is what he's trying to do. I think that's what he wants to do now that he's been reelected, is to go ahead and start mobilizing more people and them back into the meat grinder in Ukraine. I think that's his goal, and I'm going to lean on that option. Uh, but Enforcer, what say you? I would have to say I think he's going to use this to justify something against Ukraine. They made it very clear earlier today that they are going to move this into some kind of a blame Ukraine sort of a situation. I think that's still the case, and I think they're going to try and use this to possibly start justifying a conscription for the Russian army to try and build up their numbers again, but have a good scapegoat for the reason why. I think that's probably what they're going to be going towards. But with that, I hope that does address that quite well, at least in my opinion. And Matthew, there have been some very interesting things said in the chat. Can you tell us about them? All right, so our first question from the audience tonight goes to Walter A. Lakota Jr., who's a channel legend, and he threw in a very generous $200 donation hey! to help keep the channel running. And thank you very much, Walter, for that support. He says, Aloha, Enforcer, Enforcer Matt, and LSA from OG Ellison Boson. Boson. He says, what's happening in Moscow feels like deja vu again, as a radical people's where to blame in 2002, the Moscow apartment bombing, yet uh, this is actually caused by the so-called people who were to blame last time. And I take one from the chat. And I thank you so much for the amazing, incredible amount of support, Walter E. Lakota, and of course being the OG Ellison Boson. And you're absolutely dead on the nail. That's something that I also forgot to bring up a little while ago. Because really quickly, let me go back to Moscow and let me talk about this in good depth. 
So this isn't the first time that a terrorist attack has occurred in large form on Moscow. This is actually one of many times that such attacks have occurred, at least within the past 30 to 40 years. One of the biggest ones that ever happened was the Russian apartment bombings of 1999, which I believe Walter E. Lakota is talking about right now. These attacks were huge. Ended up killing nearly 307 people, and, I mean, the sights and pictures of it was pretty much like from Ukraine. These buildings were completely destroyed to the ground nearly. At the time, it was blamed on Chechen separatists or Chechen terrorists, and this is what Putin would use to justify the invasion of Chechnya a second time and begin the Second Chechen War. While that's the case, and while they actually had full-on proof, and I want to make this very clear, back in the day when this happened, the Russian government and the world had full-on proof, apparently, that the Chechens were the ones to have conducted these attacks and ended up killing nearly 300 Russian citizens in Moscow, the truth of the matter is a lot different. It's something that was uncovered around, I believe, 2005 to 2007. The truth is, is that the FSB was the ones that actually planted the bombs in the basements of these buildings in specific areas that would cause a catastrophic collapse of most parts of these apartment buildings and lead to high casualty events. Because of that, the Russians were able to kill off around 307 of their own citizens. And then right after that, they were able to justify going to war with Chechnya a second time. Going off of that, and going off of the fact that there is a historical precedent for Russia to fake this kind of a thing to justify further actions against another group of people, it's not out of the question that the Russian government would kill 60 people in Crocus City Hall to try and further their own sort of, an, uh, own sort of agenda on maybe increasing the war in Ukraine or trying to escalate it farther and have a great excuse for the public to work off of. Obviously, the Russian government has to conscript more soldiers to fight Ukraine and the evil West because they just killed 60 people in Crocus Hall, and we have to avenge these deaths. That's what the public is going to think. That's what the public always thinks. So that it would be smart for the Russians to do something like this so that way they would have a reason to start escalating even farther, and it wouldn't look like it's out of turn or out of line for the Russian government to do such a thing. And I would have to say... That, uh, Walter A. Lakota, if you were talking about the 1999 apartment bombings, that is entirely true, I would believe. And this is something that, for some reason, I didn't bring it up in the video we put out today or on stream yet until now. And I gotta thank you, Walter A. Lakota, for being a huge history aficionado as well and reminding me of something that happened in Russian history that is so important as a precedent to show that this could as easily be a false flag today as it was almost 25 years ago at this point. Uh, and so with that... I hope that does address that the best I can. Um, and uh, thank you so much once again for the unbelievable support, Walter E. Lakota, being our OG, uh, OG Ellison Boson from the Lee Spring Navy. And we will make sure to send this to the live chat as well and get a live chat question off of it. And so, Matthew, what do we got? And the live chat question is going to go to Nova, who says, Could Ukraine promise to not blow up any more oil reserves as leverage for sustained military aid from the U.S.? I don't think so, uh, because because right now, uh, that's a tough question to answer. I'll try and answer it as best I can and make sure that we don't uh, cover anything partisan. So the way the U.S. government works is that the office of the president is the one that would be calling those kind of shots going, hey, whoa, 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 we're not going to support you any further if you attack oil refineries. And then Zelensky goes, okay, I promise we're not going to attack them. And then the president goes, okay, now the support's going to come back. And then he has no authority to do that because that's entirely in Congress's court. Uh, so... I don't think that would be a smart idea for Ukraine to do because regardless of what they're doing right now, it really entirely relies on the Congress uh, to approve the funds for Ukraine. It has nothing to do with the office of the president. The office of the president is pretty much just going to rubber stamp it at this point if it ever gets to uh, their desk. So it's more of a congressional issue than anything. So it doesn't matter what Zelensky promises the president, which is the one that would be saying this to Ukraine because the president doesn't have any authority to authorize further funding for Ukraine. That's, an, that's a purely congressional issue uh and so with that i hope that does address that the best i can and make sure that we remain uh out of the u.s political sphere because that's a damn nightmare and i'm not getting into that uh but i hope that explains kind of how the u.s government functions to explain why that wouldn't be the best of ideas uh but with that um i hope that does address that the best i can thank you so much once again walter lakota for sponsoring that live chat and with that we are on to the next one and also, before we move on to our next one, just a real quick piece of breaking news. Uh, we just learned that the entire roof of the uh, Moscow Concert Hall, where the terror attack took place, is now completely collapsed. So the building has apparently collapsed in, on itself. 
Um, so there goes the whole thing. Uh, but, but with that, we're moving on to our next one here, which goes to Andreas, who puts in a $20 donation. And thank you very much for that as well. They said, I finally got a live stream after more than two years, and let's go! Hey, and welcome back, and thank you so much for the support! And welcome back, over, almost over nearly two years of a hiatus. That is quite a long one. And it's crazy to think that we've been around so long that you can come back two years later and we're still here thank you so much though andreas for being uh an amazing um viewer of this channel having watched off air a lot so sadly i don't really get to know you all too well but it's good to hear that you've been here for at least two years maybe even more than two years and we just haven't really been able to see you a lot also thank you for your first super chat of the channel ever and thank you for being one of our swedish viewers really cool all around and great to know that you're one of our european viewers because you all put in a lot more effort uh, than the Americans to watch because the Americans get to watch like at, uh, at the latest at 10 o'clock at, well, at, yeah, at 10 p.m. Eastern time at 9 o'clock in our time zone at 7 o'clock in the time zone before that and at 6 o'clock uh, if you're in the West Coast. So Americans really don't have to worry much about, uh, you know, having to have some dedication. It's really the European viewers that have to have the most dedication to watch this show because you don't have to get up at like 3 and 4 in the morning to be able to watch it. And we are greatly appreciative to each and every one of you, and especially you, Andreas, for finally getting on air live after two years and being here to watch one for real, for real. You took the pilgrimage, as we say, and we are more than happy to have you here with us tonight. And so... Thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that the best I can. And with that, we are on to the last question of the segment, and then we're going to be moving back into the news. And also, I see a bunch of people saying, do you have any footage of the building collapsing in on itself uh, in Moscow? And right now, I'm trying to scour Twitter to find some uh, video of it, as well as Reddit. I don't see any, but it is being reported by Russian state media that the roof has completely collapsed. So um, that was pretty much the worst case scenario when it comes to actually trying to rescue people uh, from the building. So it appears that has taken place. But we'll try to see what we can find about it in the meantime. Uh, but with that, moving on to our next one here, we have one from Tom Charles, who puts in a 20 as well. Hey! And thank you, Tom, very much. He says, thanks for all y'all do. And first super chat to any channel. And wow, thank you very much, wow. Tom. He says, and also, I joined Patreon yesterday. And please take one from the chat. And thank you for the support, Tom Charles, to the Patreon and to the channel through the Super Chat. Both of them go to support the channel, um, but I got to thank you for supporting us both ways. And I hope you have a fun time on Patreon. And also, if you have thrown in a DM, I will be getting to answering those by the end of the stream. So just hang tight and be patient. I will answer all of them. Uh, but thank you so much, Tom Charles, for enjoying what we do and appreciating it enough that you would throw in your first Super Chat anywhere on YouTube to this channel. Uh, that is truly unbelievable. And I always say that we are more than appreciative to y'all support. We honestly feel sometimes like we don't deserve y'all support because we're just doing what we do. We would do this whether people were supporting this channel or not, whether uh, there was 9,000 people live watching this channel or not. We would do it just because this is what we want to do. This is our passion, and this is what uh, we feel like we're meant to do. And I got to thank you so much, Tom, for enjoying that dedication that we have and supporting this channel so that way we can help to make this thing possible with you side-by-side uh, -side with us. And I got to thank you once again for supporting this channel through a Super Chat and supporting it here, uh, here on Patreon, well, over on Patreon. But still... Thank you so much once again. And also, if I remember correctly, Tom, you have been in the chat for quite a while. Tom Charles has been. I've seen you in the live chat a good bit. Uh, but still, thank you so much once again for support. I hope that does address that well. And we will take one from the chat. And so what do we got, Matthew? And the one from the chat is going to go to, uh, let's see here, Joseph M. Sika, the longtime channel legend. He says, did you hear that Russia warrants of decisive steps if the Patriot missiles actually reach Ukraine? Um... Hmm. If the Patriot missiles reach Ukraine, they've been in Ukraine for quite a while. Uh, so I would have to say there's apparently not going to be that much decisive steps because the Ukrainians have had operational Patriots for the latter part of a year now. Um, so with that, I hope that does address that the best I can, at least based on the knowledge I have, because if that was a, if that was a deal or no deal kind of a thing that would lead to world war three, we've already been in world war three for at least a year now. Um, but with that, I hope that does address that. Well, thank you so much. So once again, Tom Charles for the support and helping this channel keep on running and sponsoring that live chat. 
But alas, it is time for us to get back into the news, the actual news of what's been going on all over the place, all around Ukraine, all inside of Ukraine, all around the world. Uh, sadly, we just don't have enough news to do a, a Houthi news segment at this point. I was going to talk about that really quickly, but as many of y'all may seen, may have seen the really cool footage of a French frigate shooting down some incoming Houthi drones. I would have loved to have shown that here on this channel, but there's really no way for us to make that fit either in a video or in this news segment, so I never showed them. But it was still really cool, and you know, if we ever get the chance, and if things heat up enough down there again where we get a lot of clips, we will be able to make a news segment on that. But it's time for us to get back up in the Ukraine and talk about those sweet, sweet location unknowns. And we only have one of them today beyond the uh, the Russian loss report, and that is a map showing the travel of Russian missiles through Ukraine. Interestingly enough, the Kinzels fly in a straight line, as well as the uh, the ballistic missiles, uh, the ballisticas they're called, so I'm guessing those are Iskanders fired from inside of Russian territory and inside of Crimea. Uh, but also we can see the flight of the Shaheds in yellow. Uh, we can see the flight of the X-22s in green. Uh, we can also see the X-101s and the X-59s in red and purple. Uh, we can see the X-31P uh, in some kind of like a cyan color. I'm not really seeing it here on this map. Uh, and we can also see the other kinds of missiles that were used as well. But beyond that, it's very interesting to see that these missiles actually fly somewhat odd paths. They don't really take straight line um, past their targets. They actually do fly almost like an aircraft trying to evade air defenses wherever they may be believed to be and then come in on sides where the air defense is weak. Very odd. Um, and, of course, this map shows in probably one of the clearest ways that I've ever seen, um, which is very helpful in showing how these work. Also, by the way, you can see the path of the TU-160s and TU-95s because they base over the uh, northern Caspian Sea, and then they fly over the southern area of Russia towards Krasnodar and then fire off their missiles around right here. And this is some... Okay, I, mean, I gotta go back to this, y'all. I gotta go back to this because this is something that furthers my idea that the Russians shot down that A-50. If the T-160s, like this map shows, fly all the way into the Azov Sea and then fire off the X-22s, because it actually shows that the T-160s turn around in the middle of the Azov Sea, about right here. If that's where those are, go, uh, are firing off their missiles, if the Ukrainians shot down the A-50, wouldn't they have been able to, I don't know, maybe shoot down these incoming Russian bombers? Because those would have been in range. It's once again kind of backing up the idea to me that the Russians shot down their own command aircraft and the Ukrainians didn't shoot it down because if they had S-200s that were modified to reach those distances, they could have fired those off of the Tu-160s and shot those down, and they didn't. Um, so I'm starting to see that it's probably more so the theory is correct that the A-50 got shot down. But with that, well, the A-50 got shot down by the Russians, not the Ukrainians, but... With that, it's time for us to move on from that little map and move on into the Russian casualty reports. And check them out! Ooh! Oh, it's been a bad day for Russia all the way around, man. Like, how can they lose all these guys in the same day? Like, everything's going bad for them domestically, over in Ukraine, internationally. It's just rough for rough, uh, rough for rough for these days. Rough, rough. <laughs> but beyond that, <laughs> eight Bobcat Skid Steers were destroyed. An absolute whopper of a night. And I gotta say, hmm. That, that's just something right there. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. And I got to say, it's wonderful to see that the uh, Bobcat Skid Steers were blown away. But not only that, 870 Russian soldiers were wounded and killed, along with 37 armored personnel carriers being destroyed, 45 supply trucks, 8 main battle tanks, 35 artillery pieces, 23 drones, 31 cruise missiles, and 2 anti-aircraft systems. Overall, the Ukrainians conducted a very good defense today, and it is wonderful to see that they were able to keep that up and do their thing. And they are, of course, keeping it up the best they can. And I gotta say, it's absolutely incredible. And you know something else that's absolutely incredible? We have gotten a brand new kind of an insult from a bot, Matthew. I have never seen that before. We were called a Satanist. <laughs> like, it's like... A Satanist? A Satanist. We were actually called a Satanist. You banned the guy. Uh, but that's wild. Not only are we lizard people, George Soros funded, uh, Nazi communists, we're now Satanists Illuminati. on top of it all. Yeah, and we're the Illuminati and CIA paid, and we're also working for the NSA. I mean, we are, we're connected with all the bad, like all the baddies that the, the conspiracy theories believe in in the world. We're all of them combined. I gotta say, 
what a what a what a pedestal honor to be hated that much but anyways with that we're going to be moving on out of the kiev independence casualty report and on out of the location unknowns and on into the ukrainian front lines there wasn't really that much news that came out of the front lines of ukraine today but we did get to see that up in the Kremena forest area the ukrainians have been working on them russians And we see their BMP just sitting in the Kremena woods. And we're going to be muting that because apparently uh, the uh, freaking, whatchamacallit, what's the name of that guy, man? The Doom guy has just spawned in in the BMP and they're playing the Doom music. Man, what is this, like the, the Slender Man forest or something? Yeah, Slender Man, Slender Man. <laughs> but they're just driving on through, doing their thing, you know, chilling. We now see this guy firing his AK and the BMP firing at the same time. Tom G said, when he laughs like that, I could believe the lizard people conspiracy. Ah, uh, well, yeah, you got a point. Tom we, G. Yeah, Top G. <laughs> we got Top <laughs> G in the chat. What we'll call you, guy? <laughs> Listen, I wasn't. I wouldn't know what color my Bugatti is because I'm behind a jail cell. Listen, I didn't tell those women to be <laughs> that way. I just, I just helped them. No, nah, no, nah, pal, <laughs> you were trafficking, bro. But anyways, we can see this guy continuing to fire as their BMP unloads onto them Russians. And we can see them continuing to fire the BMP and the AK at the same time. They're just lighting these guys up. And I see some people asking about Shoigu being poisoned. I don't know at the moment. Um, you can never tell if those are true or not. Because Shoigu has died about three times over the course of the war. And he's always come back. Uh, so, you know, I kind of take those uh, those reports of him being poisoned with a grain of salt. He's probably just disappeared from the public for a little bit. And he'll be back. Man, I don't know. Uh, Shoigu was acting pretty angry yesterday when he was going through that uh, missile factory. Uh, he might have been getting a little ill then or something because he was so pissed. What the hell is this? <laughs> what is this, a bomb? Man, he'd be pissed off too if he got poisoned. <laughs> See, you might be a little angry yourself. I'm pissed off if I try to poison me. <laughs> and we can see the BMP continuing to fire. Bryn Key said, I have a BMP. <laughs> you actually could, probably. These things actually cost like 50 k on the surplus market, so they're not that expensive. Some of them even go for 30 k like the BMP-1s. Um, but their actual sticker price is like 250 No, nah, hell, it's more like 400000 500000 I believe. Oh. Oh, you got that one quicker than I could, Matthew. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, I'm we, fast with it today. I'm fast. Man, you, you got that Tazo in your blood. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. You, you're just flowing with the blood of Tazo. But beyond that, that seeing that clip in the Kremena Forest, from what we understand, Russian forces are not making any advances in this area. I can prove that if you want. And there we go. And let's check the past 24 hours. Not a single movement forward. The Ukrainians are holding them back successfully. Moving on down into the Bakhmut area, we also got to see the 30th Brigade hitting Russian targets near Krasnoarivka. This well, is they got a... that drop music, man. Man, <laughs> oh man, this is an anti-drone, uh, anti-drone system called the. Uh, sea lock and they're going to be targeting it and destroying it with that drone right there. It appears that wasn't that good at being anti-drone. And now it's on fire mm. and it's toasting. And we see the Russian Why look like a, like a deer blind or something like that? Well, I don't know, man, but you, you'd have to be a deer blind to get hit with that thing and have your oh. entire outpost go up like a wily coyote place. Oh, and he made it out. Hey, look. Bliet, <laughs> run, Bliet. I have no shoes, but I'm running. 
I just started run. Oh, 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 oh yeah, <laughs> there he goes. Wait a minute, go back that that Scooby Doo looking run. Back it up for a minute. <laughs> He's got that I saw the mystery <laughs> type run. Dude, He's that's one of the the zoinks. What the hell did he even trip on? What the hell did he even trip on? There was nothing that he tripped on. Look, he just tripped on nothing right there. <laughs> he just broke those ankles. <laughs> right, right, right there, I think. Wait a minute. Yeah, what the hell? He didn't even trip on anything. He just started weighing on. Yeah, nothing. He tripped on nothing. That's Scooby we do ass run. <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord. And then they go running into this outpost here. And he goes running into a different one. And this guy who hid behind door number one, he hid poorly. Oh dang! Oh, uh, pinata. It's Damn, a literal. A it's a literal pinata. It's it's confetti. And there's the first one that got hit in, which is still erupting in like fireballs. And oh, and here goes the next few guys. Hell? Wait, is that Man, the same guy like in the beginning? Show. Is what the, the hell is he wearing on his face? He's wearing a mask. Hang on. It looks like it looks like our Scooby Doo runner got boots now. Uh, he finally got some shoes. What is this guy wearing? Like a like a doomsday mask or something? One of those like uh, like haunted looking bird masks? Like Dude, the plague he's doctor? Like, he's like wearing a plague doctor mask out here, man. He's like, ooh, I'm going to steal your kidneys. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> the hell is going on? Oh, no, man, man, it literally is. It's the damn guy for like Scooby Doo. You know, the guy who's like the master, like um, maniac or whatever. Wait, they wait, find him. Wait, he came me, out and dressed me, as him. Let me do the laugh that all of them would do. <laughs> you know that shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it's Ivan. Oh, <laughs> he's Fine. incompetent. Fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my Lord. And these guys just keep on getting hunted down. Like they just can't get any rest. Ooh. Oh, geez, man. They're not getting away. I think they might not be coming out of that one. Why'd you say it like that? <laughs> You're like, I think they're not coming out of that one. Um, but hang on. That Scooby Doo mode, man. Hang on, hang on. I gotta go find that clip, Maddie. I let's see. Oh, hang on, I gotta go. I gotta go pull this up, man. Scooby Doo, um, UFO laugh. Maybe that'll maybe that'll find it for me. Oh yeah. Okay. So, uh, yes. Oh my god, dude! I found it. Literally pulled this up and found it. All that right, copyrighted though. <laughs> I'm um, scared, man. That sounds copyrighted. Dude, I'm just gonna speed forward to the actual laugh, right here. Okay, so I'm just gonna play it without showing the clip. But here it is. <laughs> that one. <laughs> that one. <laughs> yeah, man. That's, that's Ivan crawling out the trench to get smoked <laughs> with a bomb. <laughs> now, now you know where I was doing that laugh from earlier. I had to give context for that laugh. But beyond that, from what we understand in the Bachman area, beyond the Russians just being a little spooky this time of year, there is no frontline advance being made by Russian forces in this area. The Ukrainians are once again holding them down right where they were, and they're not moving them an inch. So great to see, wonderful to know, and great to see that the Ukrainian defense is still doing as well as it was originally supposed to do. Moving on from that and down into the Avdivka area, we were also able to see down here that a T-80 BVM was roasting. And quite nicely. It looks like the Russians ran out of white paint as well, and they started painting everything with red, which is kind of fitting because, you know, it's a, it's a blood-soaked hellhole out there at this point. But beyond that, very nice to see they were able to destroy a T-80 BVM. It's a brand new one from what we could tell. It doesn't even look like it's hardly been on the front line for long because it's fairly clean. Uh, and it still ended up getting destroyed and absolutely just roasted, literally. Um, but moving on from that little bit of news and down to the area of Pervomysky, we got to see a drone strike being conducted by the third Azov. Here's the drone coming in, and it's going straight for its target. Man, spell blase for me, Matthew. I'll be like perfectly honest with you. I'm not, you know what that means. Put it in a sentence. <laughs> oh, there's someone trying to sound all academic on me. Listen here, schmuck. <laughs> it's not like if anyone's academic, it's me. I spent four I years. About... Huh? I was, about, I was about to say, I don't know about that blase, but I know about the flambe, and that's what the Russians are getting, a little bit of that spicy cooking, you know what I mean? <laughs> Man, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, man, that person was a little flamboyant, you know what I mean? But anyways, we can see the drone coming in and continuing to hit Russian forces. And just hitting them well. I mean, they're doing incredibly well. Well done. And that's the end of the clip. Great to see the 3rd Brigade doing their thing. And I got to say, it's, it's a bit of a... It, the way the Ukrainian drone forces work, it's a bit of a blasé affair. But moving on from that, and now the area of Pervomyske, and out of the Donetsk front, because that's all the news that we had in Donetsk today, it's time for us to move down to the southern front near Huilipul, where we got to see the Russians getting hit by cluster bombs again. Here's the Russians. They're about to become the target. They are the target, and now here they are being targeted. And there goes the cluster bombs, and there's a group of Russians right there walking down the tree line. It appears to be a whole squad, and now it looks like uh, there's only a quad left. Y'all see what I did there? I gotta tell you, man, the bot influx is wild tonight. An attack happened in Russia. They said, ramp up those fryers. We got to get the bots out there on the internet now. Man, I'm telling you what, the, the bot farms like Russia is like ramping those back up again. Because like tonight especially, they've deployed them in mass, especially this channel. I've knocked out at least 50 of them. I mean, it's quite a lot, quite many of them. And they just don't understand. It's a futile, it's a futile attempt. You just get banned out of here. It's not even like you do anything. But that's the end of the clip right there. Huge credit to the 45th Brigade for keeping up that impressive work. And they really do some amazing work out there on the front lines of Ukraine. But beyond that, that's all the news we have right now for the front lines. There's not really a lot going on um, at the moment, at least as far as today is concerned. It appears that the front lines were largely quiet in most areas because there's no major offensive going on. So for now, the front lines remain stable and the Ukrainians continue to do incredibly well but moving on out of the front lines it's time for us to get up to kiev and cover the speech from president volodymyr Zelensky here on day 758 of the war and so without further ado here is the peach speech дорогі українці українки весь день зрозуміло максимум уваги всім нашим регіонам які зазнали російських ударів минулої ночі Всюди, де були влучання, триває робота з відновлення нормальної ситуації. Всі служби, ремонтні бригади, рятувальники ДСНС України, поліція, а також всі, хто залучений, працюватимуть 24 на 7, щоб по максимуму подолати цей терор. Харків і область, Сумщина, Запоріжжя, Дніпро, Кривий Ріг, Дніпровщина, Полтавщина, Одещина, Хмельницький область, Вінниця, Франківщина. Удари ці були дуже підлі, прораховані так, щоб завдати шкоди не стільки воєнної по нашій здатності оборонятися, а саме структурної шкоди життю суспільства. І це терор за визначенням, навіть без будь-якого прикриття. Загалом в Україні більше 30 людей постраждали від ударів. Станом на цей час відомо про п'ятьох убитих. Мої співчуття рідним та близьким. Значна частина енергетики пошкоджена. Провів сьогодні ставку саме щодо захисту та ліквідації наслідків. Доповідали військові, зокрема, детальні доповіді головкома Сирського та командувача повітряних сил Олещука. Також були всі необхідні доповіді прем'єр-міністра Шмигаля, урядовців, та керівників енергетичних компаній, обласних керівників. Всі отримали абсолютно чіткі рамки для дій. Відповідальність особиста. Найважче зараз у Харкові. Триває відновлення електрики на критичну інфраструктуру та для побутових споживачів. Працюватимуть безперервно. За день багато вже зроблено в Харківській області, на Дніпровщині, на Франківщині та Хмельниччині, у Вінницькій та Полтавській областях для відновлення постачання світла, води і тепла. Одещина робота триває, Запоріжжя особлива увага об'єктам гідроенергетики. Я дякую всім, хто працює заради України, заради людей. Ремонтні бригади, інженери та всі працівники електростанцій – справжні герої. Колектив ДСНС України, як і завжди, молодці. 
пишаюсь кожним. Поліція, бізнес, всі, хто підтримує, зараз дякую вам. На місцях важлива згуртована робота влади. Зараз потрібно якнайбільше особистої ефективності кожного і кожної, хто управляє громадами. Звичайно, ключове питання – це ППО. Фізичний захист об'єктів та відновлення після ударів – це те, що залежить від людей тут, в Україні. Але реальний та повний захист від російських ракет і шахедів – це те, що можливо лише за достатньої політичної волі партнерів. Кожен день наша комунікація щодо цього. Кожен день ми використовуємо, щоб переконати у необхідності, а головне – можливості повного захисту українського неба. Російський терор зараз можливий лише тому, що ми не маємо достатньо сучасних систем ППО, тобто по-чесному, достатньо політичної волі, щоб їх надати. Всі партнери знають, що саме потрібно і хто саме може ухвалити дійсно рятівні рішення. Сьогодні провів кілька міжнародних зустрічей міністр оборони Данії, країни, що є одним із найпринциповіших наших партнерів. Якби кожен допомагав саме так принципово, вже вдалося надійно захистити від російського терору життя нашої країни і людей. Ми обговорили сьогодні наслідки сьогоднішньої російської атаки і ситуацію в перспективі. Дуже цінуємо, що сьогодні разом з міністром оборони прибули керівники данських оборонних компаній, були відповідні перемовини, зустрічі. Ми готуємо спільні проекти і щодо дронів, і щодо РЕП, і щодо артилерії. Я вдячний за всю підтримку та за співпрацю. Сьогодні ж зустрівся із Генеральним секретарем Ради Європи. Говорили, зокрема, про справедливу відповідальність російської держави за весь терор. Ми в Україні цінуємо міжнародні зусилля і щодо роботи реєстру збитків, і щодо всіх форм тиску на путінську систему, щоб зменшити і заблокувати її здатність знищувати життя. Кожен, хто допомагає Україні, кожен, хто обмежує терористичний та воєнний потенціал Росії, є справжнім рятівником життя. Історія завжди пам'ятає саме таких лідерів. Саме вони здобувають для себе реальну повагу та зберігають моральне лідерство своїх країн. Ще одне. Я хочу відзначити окремо працівників нашої ДСНС, які працюють зараз у Харкові та в Запоріжжі. Я вдячний кожному. Харків. 25-та пожежна рятувальна частина. Віталій Єлізів та Володимир Водоласкін. 34-та пожежна рятувальна частина. Володимир Авраменко та Віталій Шрамко. І працівник головного управління ДСНС України в Харківській області Віталій Синчихін. Запоріжжя. Друга пожежна рятувальна частина. Сергій Терентєв. П'ята пожежна рятувальна частина. Віталій Тубалов. Шоста пожежна рятувальна частина – Костянтин Журавльов. Десята пожежна рятувальна частина – Олексій Пономаренко, а також Ігор Шабатюк, працівник Головного управління ДСНС України в Запорізькій області. Також відзначу особисто старших лейтенантів Національної поліції Володимира Гришанова і Данила Кучинського, які працюють в Запоріжжі, допомагають відновлювати і берегти нормальне життя. Дякую. Дякую усім, хто захищає Україну, наших людей, життя і незалежність. Дякую кожному і кожній, хто б'ється заради нашої держави і заради того, щоб російські терористи повністю відповідали за все зло цієї війни. Слава нашому народу! Слава Україні! Героям слава! And with that, that is the end of the speech from President Volodymyr Zelensky here on day 758 of the war in Ukraine. And that moves us on into the next segment, the segment where we get to talk to all of y'all. 
it's the segment that I find the most enjoyable because the news is the news and the news is great. But I get to talk to all of y'all and really make a connection with y'all during this segment because we get to joke and make little inside jokes and, and create new ones and come up with old ones or bring them back up. It's a fun time and we get to talk about anything we want to talk about during the segment. Uh, and also, by the way, Matthew's been pointing it out in the, in the comments, but uh, we, we have something very big to share with y'all. Today, we passed... 177,000 subscribers at the beginning of the day. We were at, actually at 177, uh, 176,640 at the beginning of this morning. And right now, we are now at 177,970, I believe. Let me check. Goodness. We are about 30 away from 178,000, man. That, what will that be? Almost like 1,500 subscribers in a day? Oh, something like that. It'd be like 13 or 1,400. That's a lot. I mean, that's, that's a lot. Yeah, that is a <laughs> that's lot. A lot. Like, that is a load. So if you are new to this channel, which there's around 7,100 of y'all here right now, so I'm assuming that a lot of y'all might be new. If you subscribe, and you know, if, if all of y'all quickly subscribe, one of y'all will probably end up being the 178,000 subscriber to the channel. Or you can just subscribe whenever you want to, and then you can end up being the 178,000, whichever way you want to do it. But still, absolutely incredible. And this is... One of many days has been like this. It's been like this for two weeks straight now where we just get about over a thousand subscribers a day. And I got to say that I'm greatly appreciative of each and every one of y'all that is coming here and joining this channel. I thank y'all. I hope y'all are enjoying it here. And I hope that y'all find this to be a quality source of news. And not only that, a way to hear the news of the war without it being a little bit too serious or being way too overwhelming. Uh, and so with that, thank you all once again. Welcome to the LSA. And not only that, once again... Once again, oh wow, we, we actually are really close to 178 now. We are only 13 away. Uh, but oh, but on top of that, today's video got up to 214,000 views as of right now as well. So it looks like a lot of people enjoyed that video again. And that is once again normal at this point because for the past two weeks, every single video we've made has gotten uh, up to or above 200,000 views. Some of them have even gotten up to a quarter million a day. Uh, so I got to say... That is incredible. Thank you all so much once again for uh, really enjoying our content and finding it to be worthwhile because it's crazy to think that so many people do. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that well. And we are on to them questions. All right. And moving into our poll that we have left to address real quick before we get to that, I see a lot of people saying that um, when will we address Putin's address that will be coming out eventually um, because Putin was actually set to come out and speak. But then he changed his mind, and then they played it off like it was a technical glitch. So he will come out and address the public at some point, I'm pretty sure. And when that happens, which will probably be, my guess, will be probably early in the morning in our time uh, tomorrow, then we will address it on tomorrow's Short War Summary, of course, uh, when he comes out. But as of right now, there is no scheduled time. Uh, but with that, we're moving on to our poll question here. And it says, Ukraine struck another major uh, Russian oil refinery after the Moscow attack. In was this bad timing? 51% said no, it was perfect timing. 31% uh, said it really doesn't matter. And 12% said it was bad timing by Ukraine. And in my opinion, uh, the timing, you know, it certainly doesn't make anything look, uh, you know, good or anything because it is an attack and it happened right after a terrorist attack. But at the same time, in my opinion, it really doesn't matter because Russia is still the enemy. And just because a terrorist attack happens in their country doesn't mean the war is not called off. Uh, because obviously Russia is still attacking Ukraine in their home country, and obviously Ukraine has to defend itself, so they're going to keep striking these refineries. Uh, so to me, I'm with the 31%. But Enforcer, what say you? I would have to say that in my opinion is a perfect time to attack all the time. Ukraine cannot help that a terrorist attack happened today. A war is still on. And on top of that, on the operational level, the amount of coordination that is needed to launch these drone attacks is huge a lot of people don't get this and i guess this is because no one actually has tried to look um has either been in the armed forces i have not been in the armed forces but they haven't been in the armed forces to figure out how difficult things are on that level or they haven't read about them like i have to figure out how difficult it is to keep everyone on the same page it is unbelievably difficult so when military planning is done it's it's over the course of months uh it's 
an endless amount of time. It really is because you have to first off start at the level of the general who gives the general overview. And then it goes down to the colonels, the majors, uh, the captains, the lieutenants, and then from the lieutenants, the lieutenants then dim disseminate the information in the American military uh, down into their actual squads, their fire team leaders, their, uh, their first sergeant, all that crap. Uh, and you have to get all these people on the same page and you have to do this for months in advance. And if there's any changes to this general, to this plan that came out the first time, you have to go all the way down that chain again and disseminate all that information from where it comes from to down to the lowest level. Uh, and that takes a lot of time and a lot of coordination. And because it's so difficult to even start things and get things rolling in the military, you really just can't stop them on a dime. Because a lot of people watch movies where like the big attack is about to happen. They're like, okay, the, the we're going to invade so-and-so then. And then they're like, wait! We have quid pro quo. And then the then the president of a country just gets on the phone and says, stop it right now. And they're able to stop it like two minutes before the attack would happen. In real life, if someone tried to do that, if a president of a country tried to stop an attack two minutes before it was going to happen, most of the attack would still go ahead because they just wouldn't even get the message in time to stop. They would just start rolling in. Um, so... That's kind of why I would say it, it, it doesn't matter the timing. They would do it anyways because the military is a monstrous beast to operate. And it takes a lot of time to even get the ball rolling in the military. Much uh, much more to actually stop something once it's already been put in motion. Uh, so with that, I hope that does address that well, at least in my opinion, as to why I don't really think it matters too much and now is as perfect a time as ever. Uh, and with that, we are on to the next one. And I, I don't know what's going on. Um... I don't know what's going on in the chat, but so many people are talking about a certain kind of a food item, a hot dog. I have no idea why, oh, but but hot dog. But if, if something is going on out there that y'all know about with the hot dogs, just make sure extra relish, extra mustard. We're on, we're we're gold, baby. <laughs> but anyways, with that, I hope we address that well. And um, we are oh. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute. Some people are noticing uh, apparently hot dogs are becoming feral. They're growing legs and teeth and they're attacking other other things. Uh, a feral hot dog seller? A feral hot dog seller? Who would have thunk? Who would have thunk? I thought we warned everyone about feral hot dogs a long time ago and then no one listened to us and now they're facing the consequences of their action. I mean, <laughs> I mean honestly, uh, I'm, I'm seeing what some of y'all are saying. We, we've consigned. It is just... It is just below us at this point to even get involved in that crap. Uh, so we're, we're hardly even talking about it at this point because we're just doing our thing and we're just moving on. But I got to say. But you know what, Enforcer? You know what, though? We, we just, just hit 178,000 178, subscribers. Ah, oh, let's go, baby. Oh, yes, my sir. Lord. That is crazy. We actually hit 178,000 today. So we've passed 177 and 178 today. Whack. Whack. Nice. That is nuts. That is nuts. I got to thank everyone who's just subscribed. Y'all have gotten it up now to, I think, yeah, I mean, like right now, we are getting close to having 1.3 thousand subscribers just today. So thank you, everyone. And also, it, this is crazy to me, Matthew. This is insane. Back in the day when the channel blew up on the fourth day of the war on Sunday, what is so crazy is that the channel got 1.7 thousand subscribers that night, and I thought that was blowing up. And right now, tonight, we're getting 1.3 thousand, 1.4 thousand, and honestly, it's just another day of the week at this point for the past two weeks, which is crazy to see. Man, it's crazy. Like it's uh, it's it's got to be the short war summaries because we know that's where most of these subscribers are coming from, and those over the last I think two weeks or so have been absolutely blowing up and getting at least 150 to 200 thousand views a piece. And I think that's where most of the subscriber gain is coming from. But also, we're starting to gain a lot of subscribers from streams as well. Like even tonight, big subscribership from the stream. Because I think uh, people are realizing we're covering the stuff as it happens. And at this late time of the night, there's not really any other uh, viable options to look at unless you want to go look at mainstream media. So it's a good place to get the info. Oh, it's a great place to get the info. I'm not biased. I'm a little bit biased. Yeah, I'm like, a little bit biased. Now that I say that, I got to tell y'all what, I'm so biased about that because I happened to, to, to be here. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. It's it's absolute, it's absolutely, nuts. It really is nuts because, I mean, it's, I, I can't even I can't even put it in the words right now. I'm, I'm not even going to try and put it in the words. We're just going to keep on going on with the show uh, because I want to make sure that y'all have something to be happy about and to enjoy. Uh, but with that, let's move on from that poll and into the next question.
All right, so moving into our Super Chats once again, we are going to move into our first one, which goes to, let's see here, goes to BC Skyman, the channel legend, who throws in a $20 donation. And BC did not leave a comment, but of course, thank you very much, BC, for being such a longtime viewer, and he is, of course, the old guard. But Enforcer, what say you? And I got to thank you so much once again, for the support, BC Skyman, and helping this channel um, to keep on running. And also, Matthew, uh, it looks like BC Skyman may have had a comment attached to his Super Chat. Uh, if he did, I don't see it on my end. Do you see it? I see it. Uh, and I was just making sure that we were not omitting that. Because BC Skyman put in a comment that said, uh, let's see here. And I'm just making sure that this is the first one. And it looks like this is the first mm -hmm. one. So I'm just double checking. Uh, so what I'm seeing here, and let me know if this is correct, BC Skyman. BC Skyman said, also a very good chance that the minority that had been thrown into the front lines came back to get revenge against the Muscovites. Many Muslims have been sent to their deaths from Siberia. And I got to thank you for the support, BC Skyman. And that is another thing that we haven't really put into the equation, is that these may be very disgruntled Russian veterans uh, that may have ended up joining ISIS to try and make it fit into the official narrative that's being put out at the moment, uh, and may have ended up joining them and attacked Moscow out of anger. That is something that's entirely possible. Uh, so... I would have to 100% agree with that uh, and, and say that that's probably a fairly good assumption. There's been a lot of angry, violent Russian veterans at this point over the course of the war, and there's no doubt that especially groups like Muslims or uh, folks from the Caucasus Mountain regions would be the most violent. So with that, I hope that does address that well, and thank you, BC Skymer, for being an absolute channel legend and helping this channel to keep on running. It means a lot that folks like you have been around for so long and have continued to support this channel and continue to throw in interesting comments. Unfortunately, we were about to miss that one. I think Matthew's spreadsheet's been having issues for like the past two nights because every once in a while, there will be a comment that just does not show up in the spreadsheet. But nevertheless, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And thank you once again for being an absolute channel legend. I hope I was able to add in my own thoughts to that as well. But with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one is going to go to John Allen, who puts in the 20. And thank you very much, John, for your support as well. He says, this is a classic battle between good and evil. And I thank you so much for the support, John Allen. And I would have to agree. This is a pretty classic battle between good and evil, I believe, in the Ukraine war. And, of course, um, the, the side of good is the West. Some people are going to be like, what do you mean? I listen, I live in the West, I live in the United States, so obviously it's not the side of evil. And on top of that, in reality, the Russians and the Chinese are the side of evil. I mean, there's no way about that. I mean, hell, you can get killed in Russia just for saying something that isn't that great. I mean, if y'all saw what happened in Crocus City Fair today, it was nuts. The media showed up to try and cover what had happened, and the FSB went out there and just started beating them because they showed up. That doesn't happen in America. I mean, you know, in America, you'll get, like, the little uh, country hick cops every once in a while that will try and, like, harass the media because they don't understand what the law is or anything like that. Uh, but beyond that, it doesn't happen commonly in America. That's that's not something that happens really anywhere in the West, for that matter, at all. But that happens all the time in Russia. And hell, in China, they'll arrest you just because you thought about sh trying to show up. I mean, China is surely the most authoritarian there is. Uh, and... I got to tell you this, Matthew, uh, th those those Chinese folks, you know, and the way they treat their own people, they really be uh, pretty hammy with the way they treat them. You know what I mean? Man, they're a little bit more than that. They're uh, a little bit brutal. Man, they're, they're a little bit brutal, man. They be putting down that Chang Chun on them. You know what I mean? Oh, is that man, right? Man, I'm telling you what, man. They be really giving them that that Dai Lane. <laughs> or however they're pronounced. Sorry about that. I butchered that you one. You don't want to put that Wuhan on them, though. Oh, 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 get away, man! You you about to, you about to make me so uh so angry. I'm about to come in. <laughs> but beyond that, uh, I hope that does address that well. And thank you so much once again for support, John Allen. Uh, and I would have to agree, it is a straight up battle of good and evil. And the West is the side of evil. Uh, well, no, wait, I got it wrong. <laughs> the West is the side oh, of good. George Russia Bush. is the side of evil. <laughs> um, but with that, I had I had a bush. So <laughs> but anyways, with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And I got to be honest with you, man. Andy, that Tazo didn't do squat for me. I'm like already like passing out over here, which is why I just had a bushism. But anyways, well, thank you gotta you so add much. milk to it. You can't drink the concentrate. Man, I think I know. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta mix it with milk. I just need busy, man. Like that that Tazo crap ain't doing it for me. Like that had, didn't have enough caffeine in it. Um, but with that, I hope that does address that well. Thank you so much once again, John Allen. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and I, I gotta tell you, Rook. Holy moly! What the hell? Hang on, uh, ARS. 
Uh, let, let me see what in the world like. That's an me, Argentine me get, get Argentine peso, I believe. What in the world? No, it can't be. Let's see. Hold on. A R S. Well, let me. Uh, bear with this agent B seven because we need to get this number accurate. I've never seen that currency before in yeah, my life. It's an Argentine peso. So it's a five dollar and eighty eight cent donation from Agent B seven who says, "Well, I hope Argentina isn't on the side of evil." Hey, and I would say it's not. <laughs> I would say that it's not at all. Uh, and so with that, thank you so much once again for the support, Agent B7, and helping this channel to keep on running. Uh, that blew me away because it's like, there's no way that that is, uh, that is like a $5,000 super chat because YouTube does not allow that simply. Uh, but still, thank you so much once again for the support and helping this channel to keep on running because folks like you help to make this thing possible. And so thank you so much once again. And Argentina is not on the side of evil uh, beyond my Bushism because now, now with the Bushism out there, now Argentina is on the side of evil possibly, but still thank you so much. Once again, I hope that does address that the best I can. And with that, we are on to whatever Matthew was getting at right before that. So Matthew, what were you about to say? Let me try to get my poor old brain working again and figure out what I was going to say. Then I, I I got so distracted by the ARS, I forgot. But let me let me think here. I was oh that's right. I was about to say a funny story. By the way, speaking of which, we got this Tazo ice chai tea thing that comes from Walmart. We got that to put in the fridge. I've been drinking it quite a good bit. I like it a lot. Um, but the enforcer went to go get some, and it's concentrated. So you're supposed to put half of that in the cup and then half milk with it to like mix it up. He drank the straight up concentrate out of the Tasso jug. So I was like, You didn't drink that out of the Tasso jug, did he? He was like, Yeah, it tastes bad. I'm like, Well, of course it tastes bad, man. It's straight up concentrate. Like, you did throw out the other half of it, though, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I threw out the other half. Man, I was I was just getting a good kick out of that. I was laughing my head off. Oh, uh, man, it tasted terrible. I was, like, I, for some reason, I feel like one of those like New Yorkers are like, Hey, Vinny, this stuff tastes awful. And the man, he's like, Well, what are you drinking? I'm drinking the Tazo. <laughs> Let me see it. That's raw concentrate, you idiot. I was like, well, no one told me to put milk in it. <laughs> and he's like, pour it out. It was straight up brown goo <laughs> that you were drinking. Ah, it tasted terrible. I was like, how in the hell are you finding this to be tolerable? This tastes like junk. Uh, and, and then it had no caffeine in it because I'm, I'm already crashed at this point in the stream. There's no caffeine in me left, and I'm just exhausted at this point. Usually with Busy, I would, I would be going like a steam train. So... Uh, and LDS Rex, like, Enforcer must be wired as hell. No, actually, it's the opposite. I'm exact. I'm absolutely worn out at this point already. I wish I had gone with my, my cold brew crap as usual, because that had way more caffeine in it than, uh, than hell, you know, any of the, uh, any of this Tazo crap had in it. I can't even talk right now. That's how tired I am, dang it. That's how tired I am. But anyways, with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. Uh, and with that, Matthew, hit us with a Jerry Seinfeld. He doesn't know what he's doing. Wait a minute. Oh my god, that was terrible. Wait a minute. Hold on. Let's see. Oh uh, yeah. It's not butter. It's not butter. Can you believe it? It's not butter. <laughs> I don't, Can you I believe lost it. it? I did it. I did it so good. Like uh, about three weeks ago, I was like on Jerry Seinfeld voice like crazy, just out of blue. Like I had never done that before in my life. I did it perfect, and now it sounds pitiful. It sounds like a dying cat. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, with what that, are you doing? Man, that honestly sounds wait, like man, I know something like that guy said, There's no water in the desert. What wait, are you doing? Wait, hang on. <laughs> Listen, I got an idea. Maybe we move the people to where they live in the freaking desert. You yeah, I sound desert. like that guy instead. So Look, come here, come here. Look, there's nothing. <laughs> but anyways. Oh, man. Anyways, anyways, with us tweaking, I, I mean, I'm, I'm tweaking, I'm not even tweaking. But with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one, next super chat, is going to go to Jackie Giacomin, uh, who puts in a $20 donation. And thank you very much, Jackie, hey! for that support. And she says, I am so disappointed in their U.S. handling of Ukraine in the year, and it's sad some have forgotten who the enemy is. And I thank you so much for the support and helping the channel to keep on running, uh, Jackie Giacomin. Uh, and I would have to say that I have been uh, slightly disappointed by the uh, government's stance on Ukraine recently. Um, because it is really, I mean, really at this point, it's a, it's a damned if they do damned if they don't kind of a situation, uh, no matter what Ukraine does at this point. And it is, you know, it's not really the best. I can't really talk about it more than that because we can't get into domestic politics because now everyone seems to be trying to tie this into a domestic political issue. Uh, so we can't really talk about it much at all, but hopefully, hopefully everyone stops 
freaking out over the upcoming election because that seems to be where, where most of the angst is coming from. And they just start focusing on what's important, which is supporting Ukraine and supporting American strategic interests long term instead of doing things short term. So that way election goals can be met, uh, because that's something that really all sides are doing at the moment, uh, you know, not not taking a political uh, trying to, you know, take a, like a partisan side here talking about both sides equally, which we can do on this channel. It now seems that both sides are trying to leverage the war either by throwing it down so that way they can get support by throwing it down or uh, telling the Ukrainians to stop doing something or they're going to throw them down so that way they can get more votes or uh, like try and persuade the outcome of an election. Um, that's something, th those two sides of things I find to be absolutely ridiculous because they're trying to tie domestic issues inside the United States to something that's going on completely outside the United States and has nothing to do with internal American affairs. Uh, and that's something I, I just think is ridiculous. And I got to thank you for support, Jackie Jackman, and I hope that does address that well. And uh, thank you once again for helping this channel to keep on running. I think it's very important for Americans specifically. Uh, I can't speak for European nations. Um, but I can't speak for the United States because I'm American. I think it's very important for Americans to realize that there's no such thing as an enemy within our borders. There are only enemies outside of our borders. Everyone in America is a citizen to each other, pretty much a brother and a sister in a national sense. Uh, so it's very ridiculous to try and uh, treat fellow uh, citizens as the enemy um, and then treat foreign nations as friends when in reality it's the complete opposite. Your fellow citizen is your friend and the Chinese and the Russians are nothing more than your worst enemies, the the ones from your nightmares that you could only imagine uh, if things were to go very badly. Uh, but with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and our next one is going to go to Aquatic Borealis, who puts in a $28 donation. And thank you very much, Aquatic, for that very generous support. Hey! They said, thanks for keeping the flame alive, and I hope to see you guys make it to Ukraine someday, and you will receive a warm welcome for all you've done. And I thank you so much for the support. Aquatic Borealis, absolutely incredible. And I got to thank you so much for enjoying that we keep the flames alive. We've been doing this forever and ever and ever and i gotta say that it's absolutely uh incredible to know that folks like you aquatic borealis uh, appreciate that we've done this pretty much like clockwork forever uh it's something that i find a great deal of pride in just to continuously do this and never stop really uh because so many people have stopped so many people start reducing their upload schedules and actually their mental health is important or other people sit there and start trying to shift their content to be completely political because they think that's going to get them more views i mean it's ridiculous how how some people have done things um i'm just happy that we continue to do things the way we have done for over two years now it's pretty much an ongoing tradition uh and i gotta thank you so much aquatic borealis for appreciating that and really enjoying our continuity uh and hopefully one day we will be able to make it to ukraine i've usually said up till this point that it'll probably be after the war and it still will probably be after the war because i don't like the idea of going over there um at least while the war is going on because the reality of the matter is that i'd pretty much be a tourist uh, i do a lot more good for ukraine sitting here in this desk in the middle of birmingham alabama than i actually do if i was to go over to ukraine in fact i'd be doing less for ukraine being in ukraine than i would be right here uh the reason why i'm saying that is because no youtuber that has ever gone to ukraine i've never actually seen them physically change the frontline situation by their presence. Uh, and I would not be one of those people either. I wouldn't be changing the frontline situation either. Bringing like, bringing three drones and, uh, you know, and then staying around for two weeks, that doesn't really do much. Drones only survive uh, on average around five days of action on the front lines. So bringing three of them is a literal non-existent drop in the bucket as far as helping out Ukraine. Over 90% of all drones in Ukraine are produced inside of Ukraine, purchased by the Ukrainian government, and then issued to the Ukrainian frontline units. Out of the other 9%, the other out of the other 9%, I think it's something like 8.5% of them are provided by foreign nations' governments. Uh, and then another, uh, then the remaining, I think it's 1.5% out of that 1.5%. Over half of that is uh, folks, I believe, on Twitter who do nothing. Like, their entire thing is just getting dozens, if not hundreds, of drones and then just shipping them into Ukraine in bulk every month. And then out of all of that, like, 03 to 0.2% of it is YouTubers like me who do, like, these massive, like, uh, kind of, I guess the best way to describe it is 
these publicity stunts where you where you fundraise for like two drones or three drones and then you bring them over there and you spend two weeks over there and then you really have no impact on anything rather than virtue signaling and getting some clicks off of doing something like that uh so to go to be honest i i would rather not go to ukraine during the war because it feels to me like i'd really just be uh a war tourist in trying to you know virtue signal and do something to uh, look more relevant and also the people who have gone to ukraine uh specifically one youtuber in particular uh it's it, it's really disgusting how they did re literally nothing really and then they act like just because they were there they're a god among men um and then that's something that i really don't want to fall like in the same category with are people who are a little too self-important in my opinion just because they went somewhere uh because believe it or not the air in ukraine that you breathe in there is the exact same air you breathe in in america so it doesn't really matter where you're breathing the air it just matters how much help you're really able to do and we're able to do a lot more help by keeping these streams continuously continuously running six days a week and also running the sunday night fundraisers which are always doing incredible things to help out ukrainian nonprofits. and so with that I hope that does address that well, and thank you so much once again for support and helping this thing to keep on running, because folks like you help to make it possible. Um, but with that, we are on to the next one. And also, really quickly to make it clear, uh, I'm not attacking uh, any kind of larger fundraising efforts, because the people on Twitter who do the drone fundraisers that are like hundreds of drones at a time, they are doing incredible work. The nonprofits that we support are doing incredible work as well, but specifically doing like one drone or two drones and then taking a two-week trip to deliver them like I'm, I'm not going to try and mince words about that that is a completely pointless endeavor especially for the amount of time that's being spent and for how little impact two drones will actually have on the war like you know no, something is better than nothing but in those instances the amount that's being provided is truly equivalent to almost nothing on an actual fractional or percentage scale uh but with that I hope yeah, me, me, me personally, I think that any any efforts, even if it's really small or really large, in my opinion, I think they're all about the same. Obviously, bigger amounts of money and bigger amounts of equipment are going to help more. That's just uh, common sense. But even on a, smell, a smaller scale, if people are only capable of bringing a few drones or something like that to Ukraine or providing a small amount of money to donate, I think it all matters a very big league. I think I think that's what Enforcer is saying as well. But I will agree, though, like making a tourist trip out of it or like a virtue signaling like a uh, whole operation, like trying to go there, film it come back and be like oh look i'm the good guy it's like you know there's nothing wrong with you know taking credit for what you've done but at the same time you don't want to make a spectacle out of it uh to where it looks like you're trying to use it for your own gain that's that's where it crosses the line um but there's good people that are doing stuff on a small scale for ukraine as well um that we may have made comments about in the past you know i'm not going to get into who these people are and things like that but I, it's all good if it's helping ukraine i'm all for it um, and let's see. And with that, I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Agent B7 once again, who puts in an hey! ARS 5000. And I'll tell you what, Agent B7, it keeps lighting it up in red and it keeps freaking me out every time I see it. I'm like, what is that? But uh, they said, hey, you do what you can do and do it best. And I'm originally from Russia, but Russia would definitely want me for at least three cases of high treason. Uh, because I'm doing as much as I can. And civilization will win. And also, US 5 bucks is basically nothing to me. I just don't need to switch to VPN to donate in USD. Hey! Thank you so much for the support, Agent B7! And thank you once again for helping this channel. And I gotta say, um, you gotta do what you can do. And, uh, you know, you gotta try... I have to agree, you have to just try your best. Uh, we are just Americans. You were actually taking a pretty big risk being a Russian because the Russians seem to hate the Russians, you know, not doing what the Russian government, uh, Russian government wants more than anyone else. But I got to thank you uh, once again greatly for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. And thank you once again for support and making this channel possible. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and the next one is going to go to Badger Bro, who puts in a $20 donation. And thank you very much, Badger Bro, for that very generous support as well. He says, Enforcer, the comments made by the U.S. regarding the refineries reeks of weakness and pandering. Uh, he says, I think instead we should warn Russia to stop attacking Ukrainian infrastructure and send tomahawks if they want to test us. And I would agree with that. Uh, I would say that we should really start to take a much more hardline stance uh, against the uh, against the Russians, and it seems as though once again we're trying to do a little bit of pandering. Really, the reality is is that we're not scared of a Russian response with the refineries being attacked. 
the thing to try and explain what the actual thing was is that I heard today is if the refineries uh, get attacked and the Russians' oil producing abilities are destroyed, well, the fuel producing abilities, they're going to have to try and get the fuel from somewhere else, which is going to be exorbitantly expensive for them. But it's also going to start rapidly ramping up the prices of fuels worldwide, which means that it'll affect the United States because there'll be rising prices here in the United States. And then someone could say, oh, look how high the gas prices are getting. Um, so vote for me and I'll make them lower. And that's kind of what they're scared about at the moment, at least from what I heard. And that's why they're like, no, don't do that because it's going to make the gas prices go up. But the honest truth is, is that the Ukrainians need to do whatever they need to do to win this war. Whatever happens in America on a domestic level is, is whatever it is. Uh, it just ends up being what it what it's going to be. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that well. And thank you once again for support, Badger Bro, and helping this channel to keep on running. And I would have to seriously agree with you. I think that that's the stance we should be taking against the Russians is a hard line one instead of trying to play one a little bit more uh, laid back. But with that, I hope that does address that well. Thank you so much once again for support. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Ken Lane, who puts in that 20 as well. And thank you very much, Ken. He says, coffee is on me, guys, and keep on keeping on. Hey! Hey! Thank you so much, Ken Lane, for the 20 Canadian. Thank you so much for the support and helping the channel to keep on running. And thank you so much for supporting the coffee. I really need coffee right now. I'm absolutely dropping dead. And I got to appreciate you so much for helping this channel to keep on running. Uh, and, and making this channel possible so that way we can drink all of this delicious coffee. Uh, and thank you so much once again for the support and helping us to keep this thing rolling. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Panama Floyd, another channel legend who puts in the 20. And he says, for the continuing updates fund, in reference to the Orcs of Venue's roof collapse, and take one from the live chat, please. And thank you very much, Panama, for supporting the continuing updates fund. I, I found over the last two days, I think that's a good uh, addition to the stream, is to sort of scour Twitter while we're going through the news and sort of add those bits in. It uh, gives you all sort of like a live feed as well, in addition to the pre-prepared uh, pre news, if I can speak. That Tazo T is uh, absolutely zooted in my brain. Um, but, of course, uh, Enforcer, what say you? I'm just going to stop right there. Well, <laughs> well, very abrupt <laughs> end, but beyond that, I got to thank you so much, Panama Floyd, for enjoying those continuing updates. We try our best to provide them, but sadly, I do have to say this. When Matthew does that, he usually throws it to me, and I have absolutely no idea what he's even talking about because it's happening live on air, so I have no time to read about it or research it, so I'm just like, uh, it's happening. It's like, it's happening. What more can I say? There's not really much I can do to add on to it, but nevertheless... I do thank you so much for appreciating that because Matthew does a lot of effort to find that stuff live because he's got a lot of responsibilities here live on the stream. It's just that I really don't have much to add to it because I kind of take all the clips that we have earlier on in the day and I piece them all together in my mind and create a story out of them to tell you all about everything that went on in the war today. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that well. Thank you so much once again. We will make sure to take one from the live chat. And the one from the live chat is going to go to Big Snack. 100 who says when putin address the attacks will you play that or just talk about it um we'll probably talk about it in an honesty uh in full honesty it's probably not even going to happen tonight while we're live it's probably going to happen uh by the time the stream ends about an hour later i would stay on to cover that but usually those things end up being nothing burgers and we can kind of just cover them as a part of tomorrow's news instead so with that i hope that does address that live chat fairly well thank you so much once again for support panama floyd and helping this channel to continue to be possible and with that we are on to the next one and the next one goes to a massive channel legend as well it's jesus ucsb oh! puts in a 20 and thank you very much jesus he says hola let me speak to the ukrainian and u.s dod he says let me quote the book the quote he said appear weak when you are strong and strong when you are weak it applies now he says and to ukraine this is the moment and there are no timeouts and lsa lsa and I say, and hey, it's the return of Jesus UCSB, the legend. And thank you so much for the support, Jesus. I know it's your, not your return. You've been here for a while. Uh, but nevertheless, it is return to the Super Chats. And I got to thank you so much for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. And I have to agree with you. It is time to go. It is time for them to get on to it and fight them on the field. I would agree with that completely. One thing that I was thinking is that a good rousing speech would really strike up the troops and get them going i had a very good one before the stream ran tonight but then i completely forgot it because i've run out of coffee uh but beyond that i gotta say that hopefully the ukrainians 
act strong and are strong um, and continue on to push the Russians until they eventually achieve victory uh, in the side of Ukraine and liberate their occupied territories. But with that, uh, I hope that does address that quite well. Thank you so much once again for support and helping this channel to keep on rolling. And look at that, Matthew, a Russian bot coming in 758 days after the three-day special military operation began and saying, the Ukrainians have been losing since day one. It's like, yeah, right. Like, you know, like, like, I don't know why the bots even argue that kind of stuff these days, because it's like, if they really were losing since day one, wouldn't they have lost it like week one instead of 758 days later? Like, just uh, the, the man, the bots, the bots are counting on people not to be well educated on world, uh, world affairs and foreign policy, but they don't know on this channel it's pointless because everyone here follows it very closely. But they're hoping that people will co uh, come across, like, for example, our short war videos that haven't known anything about the war. They'll go scroll down to the comments and they'll see a bunch of bots talking about, this is a lie, it's fake. And the, the person, they're assuming the American will think, oh, no, this is just fake news anyway. And they'll just, like, jump off of it and leave and think it's all fake. That's their goal is to try to hit the uh, the ignorant folks. Uh, that's true. They they do hit them in, ignorant folks, and they hit them hard. <laughs> do you with that? I hope that does address that well. And thank you once again for support. Hey, Zeus UCSB, and help this channel to keep rolling. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Leora Avigail, who puts in a $20 donation. And thank you very much, Leora, for that support. They said, hey, guys, it's great to hear from you, as always. And can you show the clip with the guy running like the uh, Scooby-Doo gang? Uh, that killed me. Yes, that we can. Me too. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I think this is it. Yep, this is it. Okay, so here's the clip. We found it. So they hit the bunker, and then they come running out. And here comes the guy with no shoes first. Whoa! And there he goes. Look at him. Look, here he goes. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> Man, why oh, did he dear. dry hump the, ha the ground? Like, he didn't have to do that. That was so extra. Look at this. Boom. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he did, though. And then this guy went behind door number one, and this was the one where the Ukrainians won the prize. <laughs> oh, my lord. Oh, it couldn't get any worse, can it? You know, like, it's just a joke. It's a straight-up joke. But still, I thank you so much for the support. Uh, Leora Avigili? Uh, Av uh, or Av... How do, you, how do you pronounce that, man? How do you, how do, you do that? Uh, I think it's Avigile. Uh, Avigile? Thank you, Leora Avigile, if that's the correct way to pronounce that. Uh, or Avigile, for the support. Help with this channel to keep on running. And I hope you enjoyed watching that clip a second time. It's just a fun clip. I mean, it's a fun clip because of the confetti, the guy tripping, you know, having no shoes on. I mean, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. And and I got to thank you so much once again for appreciating that clip. And I got to thank you as well for really enjoying this channel enough to support it for your third time ever. It, it just means a lot to us, and we like that greatly. And so thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that quite well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Bob Y, who puts in a $20 donation as well and says, buy a beer on me and slum Ukraine. Hey, and Bob Y, thank you for buying us a beer. We don't drink beer, but we'll drink a root beer to you, Bob Y. And so thank you so much for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. And I got to explain something real quick. Matthew and me do not drink. And neither do we have the ability to drink. Uh, if we wanted to, we would cut out so much time that we would need to have to work on this show and on this channel that we wouldn't be able to do things that we are normally doing right now. So even if we wanted to, we couldn't. Uh, but I do appreciate the kindness and the thought behind it, Bob White, because usually uh, sponsoring someone's drink is considered to be a, a thing of... Uh, of a very high praise and i gotta thank you so much for taking that effort to sponsor a beer for us and so thank you so much once again i hope that does address that well and thank you bob Y, for your fifth super chat to the channel ever and with that we are on to the next one all right and the next one is going to go to skip tracer at 007 hey! he puts in the 20 and says congratulations and i'm happy for you both and i will say and thank you so much, Skip Tracer. We are happy. And thank you so much for congratulating us on passing 178,000 subs. We're now all the way up to 178,035. And as they say, the saying is true, the Lee Spring Army just continues to grow by the day. The Lee Spring Army will never die, and the LSA will just continue to march onwards to victory, along with the Ukrainians and along with the Western world as a whole. And so with that, 
thank you so much once again for support, Skip Tracer. I hope that does address that well. And long live the Lee Spring Army. Uh, and with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and the next one goes to Herbert Lida, who puts in a 20 as well. And thank you very much, Herbert. He says, go LOC, and I can't wait to get my flag and use it to educate my friend about this fantastic site and keep up the great work of keeping us all informed with such excellent coverage. And thank you so much for the support, Herbert Lida. And thank you so much for looking forward to getting that LSA flag. It's going to be an amazing flag. It's going to be a great one. Uh, and I cannot wait to, to see the flags all over the place because there's already one out there in case y'all don't know uh the other flags are going to be coming out in a bit uh i believe that we're planning on getting the first ones out on april 22nd um around that time um but we already have the prototype flag sent on its way to the betsy ross of the lee spring army which is taurus or who which uh which is the person who designed that flag and we actually got the pictures back today of the stuff that we sent to us, or the flag, the mug, and the throw. I believe it was the little pillow or whatever it was. And it was really cool to see. I actually have it here on the Discord, so I'll go over here really quickly. Here is the LSA flag. You can actually see. There it is. That's the actual one that was pictured on the merch store with the signature in the bottom right. Well, there it is in Torosaur's office. Incredibly cool. And then in the next picture, we can also see uh, the mug, the LSA mug that we made for Torosaur as a thank you. And there is also the LSA Philo and uh, Torosaur's cute little cat. Oh, look at that cat. Isn't look at it that. precious? Look at it. Look at it. But this is in y'all's future. Uh, about a couple of weeks away, hopefully. Uh, this is, this will be out there for all of y'all, including you, Herbert Lida. You will finally get this flag. Everyone will finally get their flags. And I gotta say, it looks so cool hanging up in an office. It just looks so neat. I love it. It's, it's a very stylish flag. It looks great. And of course, I gotta give a massive shout out to Torosaur who designed this flag and made this design because Torosaur is really the one responsible for us having such an amazing looking flag that looks this good. Uh, and... Still, thank you so much once again, and thank you, Herbert Lida, for getting a flag, and thank you so much for appreciating us, keeping you all up to date and informed with all of the things that are happening around the world. We try the best we can, and if it wasn't for folks like you, Herbert, who enjoyed this channel and supported it to help it to keep running, we wouldn't have been able to make this possible in the first place. And so thank you once again, and we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Old Man Gibb, who puts in an $18 donation. And th hey! thank you very much, good sir, for that support. He says, massive congrats on the 178,000 subscribers. And thank you so much for the congrats on that many subscribers. It, it is a big deal to us. We're very happy to see it because we are very close now to 180,000 subscribers, which is insane. It's actually mental because uh, it, it, what's, what's nuts is that not that long ago, on January 10th, which was not that long ago, not that long ago at all when I look at it, we were all the way down to 156,679 subscribers, which is the lowest point that this channel ever made it to after the end of the pretty much slandering that we got in October. Uh, and then after that, we were able to start working really hard on these streams and really hard on our videos. And from January 10th to now, we went from having 156,700 subscribers pretty much all the way up to 178,033 subscribers as I'm talking right now. And it just went up to 34. Uh, that is a huge thing to us. And we're so happy to know that people are finding this channel again, appreciating what we do greatly and subscribing so that way they can hear more news that we're putting out here instead of anywhere else on YouTube. And so thank you so much once again for the congratulations and thank you for the support to help this channel to keep running. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one goes to DS, who puts in a $10 donation. And thank you very much, DS, for that support. Uh, he says, I just wanted to say, this is always my go-to, and I love my guys. And you guys made a big decision a while back, but it was the right one. And I can't wait to get my LSA flag in my man cave and love the LSA. And thank you very much, DS, for the kind words. I think we made a good decision, too, uh, if I do say so myself. And I'm glad we did, because it was definitely a big one. And while we were making it, it was uh, not as easy to make as some might think. Um, but we made it through it, so thank goodness. But Enforcer, what say you? And I got to thank you so much for the support, DS. And helping this channel to keep running. And I also got to say uh, that it is incredible that you that you find this channel to be the go-to channel. Um, in my mind, we always think, well, I always think, uh, that there's always many different options that y'all probably pick before this channel. Um, 
you know, y'all, y'all choose to go here, there, everywhere, not naming off channels because we don't advertise other channels here. I will never do that again. Um, but, but it's, it's crazy for me to think that some of y'all really do pick this as y'all's go to primary source of news. And I'm always honored that y'all do. And I'm always going to be forever honored that people find this place to be their go to source. Uh, and I would have to say that I think we did make the right decision a while back because dropping out of law school is a is a big thing because it takes so much to get there something that people just don't really realize until you try and go down that route it was actually a lot because we had to get the bachelor's degree from college we actually had to get the degree then we had to have a good enough gpa to be able to go to law school which means that you have to be up there in like the top percentile of your college most likely then you have to go and study massively for the lsat which i kind of really didn't do i kind of winged it but i still ended up making a pretty good score i made like a 156 or a 157 which for me was a great score uh and uh, then after that, after you study a lot for the LCT and take it, then you actually have to go apply to the law schools, which is a whole other hurdle in its own. It's not like going to undergrad. It's, it's a whole more difficult thing. You can get turned down really easy. And then finally, you find the law school you're going to go to, and then they hit you with a bill up front. Like, they already tell you how much it's going to cost, and it's ridiculous. It's like three times the amount that undergrad costs. And then you're like, okay, yeah, we, we'll, you know, we'll take out loans to do that. We'll do that so that we can try and become attorneys. And then you go there, and you finally get to law school after all these hurdles are made, and it sucks. Like, it's just the worst. Uh, it's 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 crazy uh and and i absolutely hated law school it was the worst thing ever uh i didn't really like uh the atmosphere at law school i didn't really like uh some of the things that you started to find out about the institutions uh like one thing that kind of stuck out to me um just on my own personal level uh is how rude some people were in certain institutions that attorneys have to deal with uh, I don't know, somebody like the bar, they're very, very rude people. Um, and you have to deal with these people. And I was like, I don't really like this. Like, I don't really like the idea of these people just being over you, your entire career. And they're like the rudest people in, in the, in the practice. I was like, I don't like that. Uh, and then I also, I just didn't like anything about it. So dropping out was a great idea to me. And it really was a great idea because we're doing well on this YouTube channel and I absolutely love doing it. There's nothing that I would do beyond this YouTube channel. This is my favorite thing in the world that I could imagine doing. Uh, and I got to thank you so much once again for backing us up and saying that that was the right choice. I certainly think it was. Uh, and, uh, also I cannot wait for the LSA flags to be seen everywhere. We can't wait to get pictures of them all over the place and they're going to be everywhere. Hell, I know that some of them are going to be in great places. We know that some of them are going to be ending up in Denmark. Uh, some of them are going to be ending up in Minnesota of all places. I mean, they're going to be like, they're going to be all over the place. They're going to be where everyone can see them. And I cannot wait for everyone in the world to see these LSA flags because they're beautiful. And not only that, they represent one of the best communities out there on the internet, really best communities in the world on the internet or off the internet. And so thank you so much once again, long live the East Spring Army. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one is going to go to Santiago Flores, who puts in a $10 donation. And thank you, Santiago, very much. He says, hey. for the office food fund and the USA forgot about its bloody raids to blow... Plosti Romania operation tidal wave. So don't tell Ukraine what to do and cheers. And I gotta be honest with you, Santiago. I don't know what that is. I gotta pull that up. Um the Ploesti Raid. Mm-hmm. The Ploesti Tidal Wave. Is the bloody raids. Bloody raids! <laughs> That's a bloody yeah. Let's see, uh, the tidal Operation Tidal Wave was an air attack by bombers of the U.S. AAF, the U.S. Uh, United States Army Air Forces, uh, based in Libya on nine oil refineries in Romania, Romania um, in 1943 during World War II. Wow. That is, a, that is a very cool picture, too. That is a B-24 Liberator right there, flying only several hundred feet above the refineries as they're bombing them. Really cool, actually. That is cool. That is pretty cool. I'd have to say, I actually knew nothing about this, Sonny. One of the historic blind spots that I have. So I'm going to have to go and read into that a little bit more and, and figure out more info about it and, and learn a little bit more history. But still, 
thank you so much once again for the support. And I would have to say the U.S. doesn't have a right to tell Ukraine what to do because they're using their own weaponry to strike these refineries. And I believe that's an overstep of American interference in the Ukraine war on what Ukraine is doing, uh, in my opinion. If I was president, I wouldn't be saying crap. Uh, I would just say go at it. But with that, thank you so much once again for support. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one is going to go to Mamba Mentality. Uh, the mentality of the Mamba, uh, who puts in a $10 donation. And it says, I won't rule out that the shooting in the theater was the Kremlin themselves for their propaganda. And look at West influence, uh, terrorist country. Mobilization needed. That's what they'll say. And that's what I'm saying, Mamba Mentality. You and me are on the same page there. Because I think they're going to use that to justify further mobilization. Some people are saying that they're going to nuke someone over that. They're not. That's that's a really, really big like escalation for 60 people dead in the theaters to start nuking people. Uh, they're probably going to justify mobilization, if anything, because of that. Uh, so with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. And thank you once again for support, Mamba Mentality, and helping this channel to keep running. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to none other than Jay Bagel, the channel hey! legend. He puts in a 10 and says, False flags using soldiers slash B are very risky to, and, uh, and too easy to uh, get caught and spill the beans. And I do find it odd that no public warnings are being issued, seeing how a terror cell is on the loose. And I thank you so much for the support, Jay Bagwell. And I would have to say that that is a fairly good argument against the false flag, that it would be pretty easy to have these guys caught. Uh, and it looks like one of them already has been caught and, you know, might spill the beans. Who knows? Oh, look, the Crocus City Hall has now been updated to be temporarily closed. It was not like that oh. at the beginning of the stream. It was actually just the blue marker like this one. But now it's temporarily closed. I wonder if they have any pictures of, uh, of the building um, post-attack. No, not yet. What the hell is this? What the hell? Does that say Top Gear on the side of that? Yeah, it does. Oh, man. Wait a minute. That's in Russia? Mm hmm It's in Russia. Hmm. Hmm. Either they're ripping off Top Gear or either they're operating there, one or the other. Uh, probably not operating there. Uh, if they I are, that's think so. Uh, but that's from 2016, so they may have been. Um, let's see, and then there's the theater hall again. We saw that a while ago. Uh, but still, very interesting. Uh, very interesting place, because I haven't really looked at Crocus City Hall a lot. Uh, and what a stupid, I, I just gotta, I'm not gonna lie, what a stupid name for like a, for an expo center, Crocus City Hall. I mean, like that's like calling uh, like my convention center the Capitol building or something. It's like, how goofy. Um, but beyond that, uh, I would have to say that that is true. That is an argument against it being a false flag. Uh, but it is a little weird, like you're saying, that there's no uh, public warnings being issued. And on top of that, uh, you were able to confirm with Matthew that the weapons they did have was AK-12s. At least some of them had AK-12s, which is something that you won't really be able to find unless the Russians give you one. So that's a very, very interesting kind of a firearm for them to have in their possession. Um, but still, thank you so much once again for support, Jay Bag. Well, and throwing up some food for thought because my uh, my mind is certainly eating that food for thought and starting to churn it a little bit to figure out what it is. But with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. Next super chat is going to go to Cliff H, who puts in a ten and says unnamed sources allegedly reported that USA requested Ukraine not to hit refineries, and this news is more likely agitator BS in my opinion. And beneath this channel's usual verified news standard, LSA. Cliff, Cliff. Uh, now I didn't add in the whole story there, but there were actually Ukrainian Verkona Rada members who were making statements in retort to what was being said. Uh, so there was an official Ukrainian government response uh, to that statement. And we also saw that Zelensky was apparently displeased by something that was said behind closed doors by the office of the president today to Ukraine. And we believe that it was that. Uh, so I didn't go through the whole verification uh, ordeal that we would have had on this channel because I wanted to make sure that we could get to the rest of the news tonight. But I was able to go through and find that there was enough of a reaction by the Ukrainian government to prove that the statement was made and that it was a factual claim, at least at the time. Um, because... Saying that something is more likely agitator BS and then actually seeing the Ukrainians respond to something that some people are saying doesn't actually exist, uh, it shows that it did exist because otherwise why would the Ukrainian government respond to it on several different official levels. Uh, but still, thank you for the support and helping the channel to keep on running, Cliff, and long live the Lee Spring Army. And with that, we are on to the next one.
And uh, the next one, while I get the 105th buy of the night, he's gone. Bye-bye. Uh, this one goes to <laughs> Octavian Timasaranu, Tim who puts in a 10 euro donation. And thank you very much for that. He says, the most medals of honor were awarded to American servicemen in Operation Tidal Wave. And my grandfather witnessed the raid as a kid and it inspired him to become a pilot and to fly military planes. Wow, that's really cool, Octavian. Really cool. And I actually didn't know that. I didn't know that the most uh, Medal of Honors were issued uh, to uh, American uh, airmen who were in those uh, raids. That's really cool. And I thank you for sharing that. And really cool to hear that your father was inspired to become a pilot because of that. Was he a pilot in like the Romanian um, Air Force uh, afterwards? That would be really cool to know. Um, they're very neat, actually. Let us know, Octavian. Let us know. But still, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And thank you for sharing a little bit more of a historical tidbit with us. And with that, we are on to the next one. And we've got another super chat from Jackie Giacomin, who puts in the... It says, I'm seeing many reports of Ukraine denying Western pressure to stop refinery attacks. It's Russian propaganda at work, question mark. And I thank you for the support, but... From what I'm seeing, it's not because we did get a couple of statements from Vrakona Rada members today saying that Ukraine has a right to strike Russian oil refineries. And once again, we did see a telegram post made by President Zelensky's office uh, talking further about some kind of a, a thing that the that Zelensky was aggravated about the President of the United States on. And we believe it was that. So uh, maybe agitator VS, but from what I'm seeing, it's most likely a true statement. Uh, and I want to say this because... We get a lot of heat on this channel for saying different things and putting out different things. We usually try and do our best to make sure the stories we put out are accurate. And a while ago, you know, just to bring up one of the most recent ones, we were the first channel on YouTube to start talking about the French possibly going into Ukraine and starting to talk about that heavily. And we were so early to the story that everyone said that we were just BSing and clickbaiting because the French would never do something like that because they're the surrender guys from World War II and they would never do anything that, that hard line. Uh, and no one believed us until two days later when everyone else finally did their job on YouTube and around the rest of the internet and started to report on the very same thing because we reported on it first. Uh, we usually are the ones that come first to a story. So uh, we're I'm pretty used to at this point people just not believing us when we put out the story because everyone else is like, you know, not to be rude or anything, but usually everyone else is so lazy at their job of reporting news that they're usually like a day or two behind us when we get to something. So uh, with that, I hope that does address that well, because, you know, we could be wrong, but usually most of the time I do enough background checking to make sure that what we report on air is a largely true statement. But still, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well, uh, Jackie Jackman. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one, Blue Flam 777 LSA, who puts in a $10 donation and says, I don't approve of jokes. I've seen too many get elected. Oh, I just love you, Green. Question to the chat. And I got to thank you so much for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. And also, um, let's see. I got to make sure to find that one because sadly, uh, Matthew, your microphone cut out there. And oh, here we go. I found it. Uh, and oh, dang. <laughs> oh, dang. That is really good. But still, Slavo Ukraini and long live the Leaf Spring Army. And I like that joke, Blue Flam. Very good one. And also, we will make sure to send that to the chat. And so what do we got, Matthew? All right. And uh, this one, and also, folks, by the way, the uh, there is some intermittent lag going on tonight. We have a fix for that on the way, and it should be installed on Monday. Uh, so we should have a very lag-free stream uh, starting Monday, or not Monday, but Tuesday, because that's the next day we stream after uh, Sunday's over. But anyway, so live chat question is going to go to Zombie, who says, Do we know what was playing at the theater in Moscow at the time of the terrorist attack? Sadly, I have absolutely no idea. So unfortunately, I'd have to declare ignorance on that zombie. Um, but still, thank you very much for asking a really good question. And with that, I hope that does answer that the best I can because I'd have to declare ignorance on that flat out. Uh, but with that, we are on to the next one. In the next, uh, the next one goes to Nate seventy five, who puts in a ten and says, "Is this war conventional? Uh, uh, money, Putin." Time going up, uh, globe sign and stuff like that. Uh, you need help, uh, uh, Snowflake. Uh, peace. Um, wait a minute, can I? Really... I don't know what the hell that means, but I, I I can't tell if that's a jab or is that a legit statement. I don't know. Um, let's see. I thank you for the support. I don't know how to address that. Um, but still, thank you for the support and help with the channel to keep on running. Eight seventy five, and with that, we are on to the next one. 
And the next one goes to stupid asshole who goes hey! back to send a six dollar donation. <laughs> oh, and says, "Okay, just say it, cheap stupid asshole." Ah, <laughs> uh, ah. Uh? Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I was waiting for you to continue on because you just laughed and then stopped laughing, and I was like, "Okay." That was good. the end of the super chat. Oh well. Oh, so, uh, well, well, I didn't know that. I thought you were just adding on to it, and then you were going to read the Super Chat. But still, thank you so much for the support, stupid asshole. And thank you once again for helping this channel to keep on running. Absolute legend of the chat at this point, and I absolutely love the name. And so with that, thank you so much once again, and we are on to the next one. And also, I see someone said the uh, the the uh, event that was playing during the terrorist attack was apparently some band called A, a Picnic. Uh, I've never heard of them, but apparently they're a hard rock band, so uh, the concert was canceled. But anyways, moving on to our next one here, uh, it goes to everything. And we actually have this super chat from last night that we didn't address because it came in late and I missed it. Uh, but they put in a five, and thank you very much. Love is everything for that. They said, can the French troops really make any difference as so few are going to Ukraine? Um, while we don't actually know at the moment how many are, uh, that's a, that's a great point though, because if it's only a brigade sized unit, it's probably not going to make that much of an impact. Uh, but if it's a division, it could make a pretty large impact inside of Ukraine. Uh, so it kind of depends on the force size, but my honest answer is no matter how big the force, it probably will have a very big effect because the French are well put together logistically. Uh, they're very well coordinated and not only that, they're highly trained. So usually their units are going to be on a much better standing against the average Russian unit if they were to go into a war with them. And so with that, I hope that does address that very well. And thank you so much once again for the support. And thank you once again um, for helping this channel to keep on running. And I'm so sorry that we missed that last night. Uh, we uh, we don't mean to. And hopefully uh, the spreadsheet issues can get solved here soon. But nevertheless, thank you so much once again. And I hope that does address that the best we can. And with that, we are on to the next one. I'll be honest. These days, like, uh, I'm sorry, folks. Like, I miss them occasionally. When the chat rate is 150 for, like, pretty much the whole stream, it is, like, easy to miss them. Uh, and that's unusual for me because typically I get every single thing. But I've been having a hard time, like in the last maybe two or three days, on these major live streams, like keeping up with this chat rate. So if I miss yours, feel free to give me a shout uh, because we don't want to miss out. And we're not deliberately ignoring anyone's super chat. So feel free to just message me if I'm not seeing it, and, and we'll definitely add it. And also to give you a little bit of like a quality of life update, uh, because of the of the streams becoming so big recently, because they went from being around 4.7 to 5.5 thousand live viewers a night, which was huge already, to now we're getting close to eight to 10,000 live viewers at the peak each night, and the live chat really does reflect that. Uh, we're, we're kind of debating in the background turning on slow mode again during most streams, so that way we can ensure that there is quality uh, as far as it goes with us dealing with Super Chats, talking to Super Chatters, and also dealing with everyone in the live chat. Because right now, there are just so many live chats coming in at any given point in the stream, except for right now. The chat is actually a good bit slower right now. Um, but earlier on the stream, it was around 150 chats to 200 a minute, uh, which means that there's about three live chats coming in every single second. Um, so you can kind of get an idea of how quick that really is. So we might have to drastically uh, reduce that by putting on a slow mode in the future so that way we can make sure to get the super chats and address them properly. Because lately, we've been missing entire paragraphs that have been attached to super chats or super chats entirely. And we want to make sure that we are able to address those and also get live chat questions as well. So we might have to slow things down. Just letting y'all know, just giving y'all a heads up, that might happen in the next few days if this keeps up. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that well, and we are on to the next one. And up next, a uh, uh, excuse me, Agent B7 put in that 1,000 ARS once again. It keeps showing up in bold red. It's scaring me every hey! time. He says, just a buck. Uh, and the ones who were playing is a band, Picnic. Um, and they were uh, one of the first band to play in occupied Crimea, and I don't think they ever opposed the war. Uh, the lead is famous for tweeting, I don't give a damn about sanctions. And also, by the way, uh, one of the uh, band members of that band uh, cannot be reached at the moment. So he might actually be in the in the building rubble. Uh, but Enforcer, what say you? Uh, and I would say that's very interesting info to share with us. I actually didn't know about that. And um, interesting name for a band, Picnic. Uh, but, you know, still, nevertheless, I thank you so much for support and sharing those facts with us because I didn't know anything about the band or who was even playing there uh, before that. But still, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. 
And up next, a huge shout out to Nick, still thanking LSA, who put in a five, along with Juan Pablo, who put in a five, and also Michael Murhivel, or Murville Hill, I think. But thank you very much to Michael, Juan, and Nick, very much for that support. And Enforcer, what say you? And I got to thank each and every one of y'all for the support. Y'all didn't throw in comments, but the support means a lot and helps us to keep this thing running and helps it to be possible. If it wasn't for folks like y'all, we wouldn't be able to make this channel possible. And I got to thank y'all once again for finding this channel worthwhile and taking the time to support it tonight because it means a lot to us. And so with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to CK Bold, who puts in a five and says, take a live chat question. And we will get a live chat question. Thank you very much, CK Bowl, for that support. And it's going to go to uh, MacDaddy, who says, any update on French troops possibly going to Ukraine and North Korea update? Uh, North Korea update? They are doing their thing. Um, they're they're hostile with everyone, but it's not really kicking off on anything. And then uh, as far as the French update, their rhetoric is still strong, but we're not seeing any direct action of French troops going into Ukraine yet. Still looks like they're in the preparation phases for something like that. Uh, and so with that, uh, I hope that does address that quite well, at least in my opinion. Uh, and, and with that, thank you once again for support and helping this channel to keep on running. Um, and oh, Matthew, I wouldn't. Uh, you oh, would, it is a bot. It is a bot. It's a bot giving us money. I, I can't complain about that, honestly. But oh well, there they <laughs> there they go. They're super. That is one super chat that we will not recognize. Uh, but beyond that. Also, Matthew, there was a typo. We have 3,500 likes, not 2,500. I was like, 2,500? I looked at that. I was like, that many for this little view, for this many views? No, it's 3,500. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that fairly well because we found out that bots are now paying us. Uh, this just in, folks. Bots are paying us. Uh, but anyways, with that, we are on to the next one. And also, the next one is going to go to Impromptu Ninja, who puts in a 5 and says, OSINT reviewed one of those AKs. It was an AK-12 with AK-47 Vanguard M-Lock handguard, and there are picks. And Impromptu, we actually got, I believe it was confirmation of that fact, uh, from an uh, in-house firearm expert that we're friends with here on the channel. Um, but Enforcer, what say you? And I would say yes, they are AK-12s. Some people said earlier, you can't tell what rifle it is. Yes, I can. I can tell. I'd look at rifles enough all day, every day to know what rifles look like what. You don't have to be like a damn expert to know. It's just visual identification. You look at something enough, you recognize what it looks like, and then you can tell all the time. Like, like this. You know what? You know what? I'll show you. I'll prove it to you. Here we go. All right. We pull up images of French soldiers. Guess what? Boom. This guy's got an M4 carbine, an M4A1. Boom. It's that easy. Boom. Body yada. Look at this. HK 416s. Boom. Right off the dot. You can tell. Look, it's a FAMAS. I mean, easy stuff. I mean, it's, it's not it's not that hard. Um, But beyond that, I hope that does address that quite well, at least in my opinion, because it, it's not hard to identify rifles uh, to me at all. So, you know, you just see them as like, yep, that's an AK-12, simple as. Uh, but still, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that quite well. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right. And also, unfortunately, that lag on that end is going berserk. Like every two seconds, you're going meow, meow, meow. But anyways, well, we'll have to get a fix can, for that. Yeah, hopefully we can switch that out on Monday. But with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Neil Vizinon, who puts in the five and says, I think Russia let the attack happen to use it as propaganda. It is a false flag and isn't. Uh, yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that. I think uh, like the lack of security at such a massive expo center is pretty wild to me. And I would also have to say that it seems as though like, it most like it was a false flag to me. I'm going to go with that for now because I'm sure the Russians are going to blame that on Ukraine and justify it for further escalations. I'm sure of it. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, you know, and, and I'll just take it for what it is. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that well. And thank you once again for support and helping this channel to keep on running. But with that, we are on to the next one. And we have another super chat this time from Impromptu Ninja who puts in a five and says that there have been previous recordings, Kenzel, Sounds like it goes backwards when it goes overhead because that is how sound works, apparently. Yeah, I, I suppose so. Uh, but it does sound really weird. It sounds like an air raid siren nearly or some kind of a death whistle. Uh, but still, thank you so much once again for support and sharing your uh, interpretation of the sound with us because it is a very haunting sound for sure. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that well. Thank you so much once again. And with that, we are on to the next one. 
And this one is going to Big Snack 100 once again, who puts in the five and says the reason the number of French is so low is because it's called a tripwire force and essentially it's a deterrent. And I thank you so much for the support, Big Snack 100. And um, you're probably right. Um, but as far as French forces going into Ukraine goes, it, it's 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 not really a deterrent because they're going into an active war. So it's not like it's a small force going into Ukraine before the war starts to prevent the war. It's a small force going into Ukraine to be involved actively in the war. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I see what you're saying there, though. I, I know what you mean, and I completely understand. But at the same time, it's not really what I would consider in my mind to be a tripwire force because that's usually to deter a war from beginning, uh, not to move them in while a war is going on and then try and deter something then. Because there's nothing to deter. It's already going on. Um, but with that... I hope that does address that well, and thank you so much once again for sharing that, because that is uh, correct what a tripwire force is. But with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Colin McMenemy, who puts in a five and says, I recently found and love your channel for news on the war in Ukraine, and moving on from that, you have a new subscriber, and keep up the good work. Hey. And also, welcome, Colin. Welcome, Colin, and thank you so much for being a brand new subscriber. I hope, you, or you hope you're here to stay, and I hope you enjoy it here greatly, because... Uh, we try our best to make this as enjoyable as possible every single night. And if it wasn't for folks like you who just joined and find this place to be enjoyable, uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't really have a reason to run this thing. And so I got to thank you so much for that. I got to thank you for the kind words. And thank you for just getting here and becoming a brand new subscriber. And so with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Nova, who puts in a five and says, could Ukraine leverage the U.S. for sustained military aid by promising not to attack any more oil refineries? That is a great question. And Nova actually asked that one as a live chat. And we answered it earlier. Uh -huh. And then Nova threw it in right when we were answering it as the live chat. Uh, so we already answered that question. But I got to thank you so much, Nova, for the support and asking the question both in the live chat and the super chat. Thankfully, uh, another very nice viewer sponsored your live chat earlier. And I got to thank you so much, Nova, for the support, your first support to this channel ever and helping it to keep running. And I hope that our answer earlier in the stream was good. Uh, and so with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one goes to Anton Sugar, who puts in the five and says, do bots get paid for engagement uh, or just to sit in front of a PC and become a nuisance to the civilized world? I think they just get paid to be a nuisance, I really think, because I, I don't think they get paid by engagement, because then that means that bots would put like a big red flag on our channel saying do not enter or do not attempt, because they don't really get any engagement here, they just get banned instantaneously. Uh, so with that, I hope that does address that well, thank you so much once again for the support, and with that, we are on to the next one. I think they get paid like, what is it, like uh, one like potato uh, per every like thousand posts or something. It's probably some measly pay. It probably doesn't pay to be measly. a bot these days. Measly, a little small pay. Um, and also I saw Mac Daddy said in the live chat, I bought some English tea on your recommendation. Uh, and oh, good, good, good. Uh, try that chai tea uh, sometime too. That's also very good as well. But with that, we're moving on to our next one here. To James Hughes, who puts in a $50 Yay! donation. And thank you, James, as well, for that support. He says, hello, Enforcer and Matt. And hello, James. Hello. He says, do you think with the growth of the LSA, the Sunday night goal can move back to 5,000? And I thank you so much for the huge support, James Hughes. And probably not, sadly. Uh, because the thing is, is that over time, the Lee Spring Army has started to slowly decrease the amount of funds it can raise on a single weekend. And right now, the Lee Spring Army is kind of struggling to be able to get close to five thousand uh, dollars. So back back in Christmas, it was it was my understanding then that most people were probably getting Christmas presents or something along those lines. So they probably weren't going to be able to help out fundraisers as much as they had been in the past. So we dropped them from five k to three k as the fundraiser goal. And then over the month of uh, of December. It still ended up getting over 5000 but barely. Uh, and then after that, I was like, okay, let's see how it goes in January, and then we'll start to bump it back up if it starts to get a little bit higher. But even then, it was hardly getting above 5 k and most times it was in the 4Ks. Uh, and at that point, I was like, yeah, I don't want to bump it up any higher. Because the thing is, is that uh, people, people for some reason out there in the world view the LSA as a money tap, where I can just turn it on and just like increase the flow. Um, but the flow is entirely dependent on viewers and what they want to do. The amount of super chats that we earn is entirely based off of folks like you, James Hughes, that enjoy the channel and want to support us and help us to keep it running. And the amount that we're able to raise on fundraisers is entirely dependent on how many people in the Lee Spring Army actually want to support a fundraiser and help that fundraiser out. Uh, and so far, it is 
uh, largely been it's largely been seen that really in every in every category slowly over the war supports going down on everything both in super chats and support to fundraisers uh, so as the war keeps going we have to kind of tighten the belt and make the goals uh, smaller uh, so that way we continue to pass the fundraiser goals because otherwise I'm going to be setting goals that are way too high for the Lee Spring Army and it's going to put a lot of pressure on people to probably give money that they might not be able to give because if they wanted to give it uh, they would already be going well about five thousand dollars on every weekend on every Sunday but uh, it, we're rarely ever seeing that these days and not really that many people get involved with the Sunday fundraisers uh, anymore because, because there's been so many of them. I mean, like the actual reality, uh, is that people, people on this channel alone, and it's really the same people who have been here since the beginning, all of y'all have raised $1.3 million for Ukraine through all the nonprofits that we've run over the war. That's $1.3 million from honestly, a couple of hundred people over two years. That is a lot. And I don't really want to put a lot of people, James, under any kind of undue pressure, uh, because of course, this channel supports Ukraine as much as it can, but I don't want them to support Ukraine more than they can. Um, because then it goes from being a great thing that helps out Ukraine and they also get, and the Lee Spring Army gets to help out, to it goes from that to the these folks who are helping are so kind-hearted they want to reach these goals and they're ending up hurting themselves financially uh, and they're ending up helping Ukraine. And then that's a lose-win kind of a situation because the Lee Spring Army and the average Lee Spring Army soldier is losing out on that battle, but the Ukrainians are winning. I want both sides to win as best as they can. So that's why, unless if this Sunday fundraiser was unbelievable and it got up to like 7000 to $10,000 or something, the fundraiser goals are probably going to unfortunately stay around $3,000 well into the foreseeable future. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that well. And I thank you so much once again, James, for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. Uh, and I hope that answers why the goal went down to 3000 and it hasn't really gone up because well, I mean, like, I have to, I have to make sure to put this out there. At the beginning of the war, the goals were like fifteen thousand dollars a fundraiser, and then the fundraiser started to get close to fifteen thousand. Then I bumped them down to ten, and then they, uh, then it went from fifteen down lower to ten over time, and then the fundraiser goals went from ten thousand to five thousand, and then the amount that the LSA would raise on a single weekend started to go from ten down close to five, and then around uh, November of last year, uh, then the fundraisers were only starting to get barely above five thousand. So then in December, we lowered it down to three. So they've continuously been going down in the size of the goals. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully one day the Lee Spring Army will be able to bounce back and uh, start supporting more. But I never want to pressure them into doing that. Um, but with that, thank you so much once again for support, James Hughes. I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Agent B7, who puts in a $100 donation this time. Massive support, and it's an actual 100 USD, hey! and it's popping up red. <laughs> and thank you very much, B7, for that support. And he says, I think uh, that's for all my undeserved reds. He says, I can afford it. Don't worry. Um, and he says, keep up a good work, guys, and some of it to Ukraine, will you? And thank you so much for the incredible support, Agent B7. That is absolutely incredible. Uh, and... I got to thank you so much once again for enjoying that we read off all of your reds. Uh, they're like $5 reds, so they're probably the cheapest red Super Chats that have ever been put in on the channel, but really cool that you could do it. Uh, but also, thank you so much once again for enjoying us, keeping up the good work. And of course, we will give some of it to Ukraine. I personally give $100 minimum um, every single Sunday to the fundraiser. You can usually see that when you're here during the first uh, 10 minutes of the show. I usually throw it in then on Sunday during the 10 minute countdown. Uh, so if you are here this Sunday, you will see me throw in that hundred that you gave right there, pretty much right back into a fundraiser. So none of that will be going to us pretty much. It'll just be going entirely to Ukraine, but still thank you, uh, so much once again for the support. And I hope that does address that well. And with that, we're uh, moving on to the next one. Before we do though, uh, I saw Bruce Lee say war fatigue and people are broke, I'm guessing. And that's, that's what we're guessing because so many people have given so much. There's not really a lot more to give. And then some people out there who are just absolutely idiotic act like I'm supposed to be like grabbing a whip and start whipping y'all to start making y'all throw money into a Ukraine war fundraiser basket. Uh, and the reality is at that point, that is just sick to treat a community like that. Like it's just like, a milking machine where you can just milk uh, the community dry. If y'all do not have the ability to support Ukraine uh, the way we used to back in the first few months of the war, 
I don't consider that to be bad. I don't consider that to be good. I consider that to be reality. I mean, y'all done way too, uh, like way too much in my opinion already. This channel alone has fundraised more than probably most other YouTube channels combined right now. So the fundraisers are getting to where, you know, we can only put a $3,000 goal and the channel raises four to 5,000. I consider that to be a great fundraiser because the LSA has already done the heavy lifting um, for the most part on YouTube. And there's not really much more that it can do if it wants to. Uh, and at this point, that's why I'm always blown away that we're still passing fundraiser goals it's like a freaking miracle it's 758 days later after the war started 1.3 million dollars later and somehow we're still passing goals somehow some way uh so i find that to be unbelievable um but with that i hope that does address that well and we are on to the next one hello hello and we are on to the next one and the, this one is going to go to Agent B7 once again, who put in a two this time and said, I'm a she, to be clear. And also, they're a defense contractor as well. They work for one of the big ones. Uh, but sorry about that. I, just, I resort to he by default. When I see someone, I'm like, Agent B7, I assume he. But that is she, to be clear. And thank you very much for the support. And Forster, what say you? And I thank you so much, Agent B7. Sorry about that. Uh, we do usually assume that uh, anyone who's watching is a man because, believe it or not, 91% of our viewers, according to the analytics, are men. So there's only 9% of y'all that are that are women. So I'm sorry, so sorry about that, uh, Agent B7. Um, but still, thank you so much for clarifying that. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one is going to go to Jenna, and last name Tolls, who puts in a $5 hey! donation. Does any progress on the Belgorad front? Uh, at the moment, no. It appears that they advanced, and now they're holding their territory, and they are not making any further advances at the moment. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that well. Thank you so much once again for support and helping this channel to keep on running. And with that, we are on to the next one. And this one is going to go to uh, LSA Warrior, who puts in a five, and says, Putin fears Jesus UCSB. Uh, and I would agree with that. <laughs> I would agree with that 100%. Uh, but still... Thank you so much once again for support and helping this channel to keep on running. I hope that does address that fairly well. Uh, and with that, I'm seeing I'm seeing that we're getting a lot of heat in the chat. Hey, y'all, listen, <laughs> like listen, sorry, but um, you know, we we go off of the analytics. Like when when we think of our average viewer on this channel, going off of our analytics, we usually think of something uh, of a man in between the ages of 45 to 65 because that's what that's what most of our viewers are are men in between the ages of 45 to 65 so if you're outside of that sorry we just usually assume that we're addressing someone correctly because that's most of the channel's viewership but if you're not if you're not that's fine that is fine we are more than happy to have everyone else here uh women you know <laughs> just women people uh, younger than 45 people older than 65 uh but it's great to see that the 10% of women viewers that watch the stream are in the live chat right now because we always love the ladies and the ladies love Enforcer Matt. Give it up for the cult of Matt. But anyways, with that, we are on. Hey, buddy, but, but with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one is going to go to Lee Parkinson, who puts in the five and says, LSA. And, hey, and thank you so much, Lee Parkinson, for the support. And LSA. And thank you so much once again for the support and help of this channel to keep on running. And with that, we are on to the next one. And we are moving on to this next one here, which also goes to Agent B7 once again, who puts in a five this time and says Ukrainian beer and soda are better than Russian. And also, that's the last one, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you for the support, and I would say that it's probably better because anything made in Russia has got to be pretty dog quality. Uh, and so with that, thank you so much once again for support. I hope that does address that well. And we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Tom Charles, who puts in a five. And thank you very much, Tom, for that support. And also, Mamba Mentality put in a four as well without a comment. But Enforcer, what say you? And I got to thank you all for the support. Y'all didn't throw in comments, but we always greatly appreciate each and every one of them because y'all helped to make this channel possible. And so with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And this one is going to go to Dr. Oetker, and it puts in a two. and says, a bright light casts the darkest shadow. And yeah, so I would say that's a pretty good one, right? <laughs> I would say that's a pretty that's a pretty deep. That's deep. Uh, but still, thank you so much for the support, Dr. Oker, and helping this channel to keep on running. And I hope I addressed that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Jenna, last name Tolls, who puts in a $20 donation and says it's pronounced Jenna's. 
and thank you so much for the support. Genitals. <laughs> it didn't help with this channel to keep on running. Because folks like you help to make it possible, genitals. And so thank you so much once again for the support, genitals. We got to make sure to get that right. We got to pronounce that correctly, genitals. And thank you once again. And with that, we are on to the next one. But thank you so much once again. And the next one goes to Siba, who puts in a two and says, LSA, always and forever. And LSA forever. And thank you so much for the support, Siba. And thank you once again for helping this channel to keep on running because folks like you help to make it possible. And also, Matthew, you're taking my life, which is one of our uh, female viewers said, I think your stats are wrong, LOL. Uh, it seems like us girls make up more than 9%. Or maybe we just chat more, LOL. Y'all just chat more, actually. That's the reality of it. Uh, because uh, we, I, I've always noticed that it's a bit of a weird thing because on a given night, um, it, it viewer, the female viewers make up 9% of our viewership almost every single night. Uh, but at the same time, y'all make up, uh, something like, well, I don't want to get the demographics on the live chats, but I do on super chats. Y'all make up something like 30 something percent of the super chats. So y'all represent a lot more in viewer activity than the men do. So huge shout out to the women of the Lee Spring Army because y'all are a lot more, uh, active than the men are for the most part. But still, with that, I hope that does address that well. That's why it looks like there's a lot more women here because the women are just simply more active. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that the best I can. We are on to the next one. And the next one is a big shout out to Badger Bro, who put hey! in a two. We also have a two from Cat Chaser, as well as Gumby S, along with Vladimir Vladimirovich, The Lost, Carrie Ann Corzo, and also Amy Mason. And a huge shout out to all of you for that support, because sadly, there was no comments attached, so there's nothing to address. But of course, it does help keep the channel running. You great, greatly appreciate it very, very much. And Enforcer, what say you? And we got to thank each and every one of y'all for the support. Each one of y'all's support means a great deal. We greatly appreciate each and every one of y'all. Because if it wasn't for folks like y'all, we wouldn't be able to keep this thing running. And so thank y'all once again. I hope that does address that the best I can. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Big Snack 100 once again, who puts in a two and says, Thoughts in U.S. hypersonic aero test. Um, great to hear that we did it. We've had that tech since about the 50s and 60s. We just kind of abandoned it because it was a pointless dead end. And I don't ever think that we'll actually use those things uh, in their intended purpose because it's really a it's a pointless technology, in my opinion. Um, but with that, I hope that does address that well. Uh, I think it was to give us support. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one goes to, uh, oh, goodness. What? Deary me, the Nightbot took care of that one. Uh, this one goes to a big snack 100 once again, who puts in a two and says, I'm so confused about hot dog. Oh, well, I, I wouldn't even worry about hot dog to, to summarize the story in short form. Um, crazy mental loony case attacks us. We strike back. People attack us because we defended ourselves. Now they're getting attacked. Ha ha. That's really the whole story. So, uh, with that, I hope that does address that well. And thank you so much once again for helping this channel to keep on running. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one is going to go to Nate75. Uh, the long lost Nate75. <laughs> who put in another two. And the bot donated a total of, I think, $8 or $10 even uh, the entire night. And he ended up trying to roast us in the last one, and then he got struck down. So Nate75 is no longer. Uh, he's left the channel. Uh, he's left the building uh, uh, for good. He's not coming back. Uh, but with that, we are now fresh out of uh, Super Chat questions. So once again, thank you all very much for that support. And we're now moving on to our live chat questions. And up first, we had the Morse Code Decoders of the stream. Uh, and it's Cliff Simonson, Mark Hodges, Earl Bernou, Paul Schultz, Kevin J, Rumpelstiltchen, David Millsaps, and Toxic Bananas. Uh, and it says, uh, Enforcer LSA Signal Corps reports tonight's Morse code dispatch is Crocus City Hall was nearly a false flag attack. And notice how hellbent Russia was to make it one. Long live the LSA. And ding, 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 That's the sound of money because y'all hit the jackpot dead on the nail. And that is absolutely incredible to see. We are very proud of that. We love to see that y'all continue to get the Morse code message correct day in and day out because this is the 758th day and y'all got it again. Jackpot, baby. But with that, we're about to be moving on into our question segment. But I got to be honest with y'all, I've been dragging um, for about the past hour and a half because I have no coffee in my system or no caffeine in my system. So I am just here. So we're going to be answering uh, how many live chats do we have, Matthew? We have about five. 
So we're going to be answering those five live chats and this one super chat that just came in, the first one ever from Jabed. Hey! And we're going to be answering that. Aye. Then we're going to get to the five live chats. And then we're going to round out the stream. And so with that, Matthew, what does that, what does that super chat say? And this five from Jabud, who says, uh, at four, close the door, don't be late. Five minutes, sand drop to glass. And I thank you for the support, Jabud. Um, a, a very interesting statement right there. I believe it requires further study from the LSA Forensics Department. But still, thank you so much for your first support ever to this channel and helping us keep this thing running. Because folks like you help to make it possible. And so, thank you once again. And we are on to the first live chat of the night. And this one is going to go to Anani Mouse. Uh, and also, Heather Fitzgibb and I did ban that bot right there. They are gone. Uh, but Anonymous's question says that there are reports that security forces were the first to leave the building, and why? Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> Might be a little bit cowardice. Might be that they were told to. Who knows? <laughs> but beyond that, hope that does address that well. And we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Private Public 77, who says, Why attack now and not during the election? There were a lot more mass gatherings during the election than now, and my vote is a false flag. Uh, that's what I'm uh, kind of leaning towards as well. Um, and also, uh, some people are saying, can we not see a certain account? I think we can. Um, hopefully we can find it and knock that one out. Um, it's gone. Uh, thank you. Uh, so with that, hope that does address that well, coming out of the live chat. Uh, but... The reason why they probably weren't attacked during the election is because whoever was orchestrating the attack, whether it be ISIS-K or whether it be the Russians themselves, they probably wanted to make it look like it wasn't really attached to the election because then that could create a whole bunch of unnecessary drama and uh, loose ends that they wouldn't really be able to tie up too well. Now that the situation is under control and there is no election going on, it's a perfect moment to do the attack because the Russian government can now uh, draw it up however they want. There's not really a lot of, uh, I guess you could say, public speculation out there but with that i hope that does address that well and we are on to the third to last question of the night and this one goes to carrie ann corzo who says in one of the videos from moscow it seemed like the gunmen were set more on destruction than death and what are your thoughts um yes it did seem like that but at the same time they also were uh mowing down a good amount of people um to put that in no better descriptor because i saw plenty of videos where they were just going up to crowds of people pretty much pitting themselves up against the walls and we're just hosing them down. So, uh, they kind of both, kind of both. They were just hell bent on just causing death and destruction pretty much combined. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address it. Well, great to see that you threw in a question, by the way, Carrie Ann Corzo, uh, in the live chat. And with that, we are on to the second to last question of the night. And this one goes to top G. What call is your book? Uh, he you says, uh, what do you think about Ukraine hitting Russian power plants? Also no power for military products. Uh, or refining or pumping of oil, gasoline, diesel, or natural gas? Um, I would say if the Russians are going to hit Ukrainian power generators, not that I'm a big fan of this idea, but I feel like that should open it up to be fair game for the Ukrainians to strike back at Russian power generators. Uh, but once again, I feel like the Ukrainians should try and rise up above the Russians and not do the same low-life low things that the Russians do against them. Um, because if the Ukrainians do the same thing the Russians are doing, what makes the Ukrainians worth fighting for compared to the russians they're no better than them uh on a moralistic level so that's that's kind of my argument against doing something like that but i could see why people would want to and so with that i think matthew are we on to the last question of the night right here this is the last question of the night all right and so who is the lucky last person to throw in the lucky last question of the night and that viewer is juan uh, who says, um, oh, also, Hal Rose is throwing a super chat. But Juan said, I wonder at what level the attacks on the oil refineries get approved. Like, is it Zelensky approving the attacks himself, or is it done more at an operational level? It's probably done at the chief of the armed forces level. Um, that's something that probably doesn't really concern the president too much. Uh, the president of Ukraine probably said... Uh, like the general probably recommended we attack oil refineries. President Zelensky said yes. They said, are there any limits? Zelensky probably said no. And then the attacks were then uh, coordinated and planned by the chief of the armed forces, uh, who then uh, sent that down to the unit commanders. And then the unit commanders coordinated their specific attacks on their level, and then they conducted them. Because that's usually how a chain of command system would sort of work. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that final live chat of the night. And now it's time for us to circle back really quickly to a super chat, and then we'll be rounding out tonight's stream 
So the super chat this is going to round out the stream for the night goes to Hal Rose, the channel legend, who throws in a very generous fifty dollar donation. He says, "In Force Met, let's talk about the average viewer for a minute. I'm old guard, so if my in this is one dollar, I've covered forty nine of the three thousand nine hundred and twenty six subscribers who can watch for free." Slav Ukraine and Slav Ukraine, and thank you so much uh, for the kind support, the incredibly generous support, Hal Rose. And um, I guess you could look at it that way. But one thing I look at is that no viewer owes us a dollar, not a dime, uh, not even you, Hal Rose. If you don't want to support the channel, you don't have to. It's something you you do if you appreciate it. If you want to support the channel, I never want anyone to feel like they're being pressured, like they have their arm put behind them to give us the cash. You can, you can, or you can't. You don't have to. You don't you ever have to. It's never, never a forced thing. It's a choice. It's a choice. Uh, but beyond that, I do thank you for the support and looking at it that way because your support does help us to make this thing possible for everyone here, for all four thousand people, three thirty eight hundred actually, who are here right now. Um, but with that, thank you so much once again for the support. I hope that does address that well, Hal Rose. And with that, we have reached the end of tonight's stream. I've got to thank every single one of y'all, including Hal Rose, and also, once again, to round out your super chat, well, Slav Ukrainian, long live Lee Spring Army. We have finally reached the end of tonight's stream. Uh, we are greatly appreciative to each and every one of y'all uh, for being here with us each and every night, enjoying this channel, and not only that, um, supporting us by hitting the like button, watching this thing on average 13 uh, minutes and a half per viewer, it is absolutely incredible. Not only that, the amount of people who've come here tonight was absolutely unfound, like unbelievably. We rarely ever see 9.5 thousand people on the stream live all at one time, but we did tonight. And I got to tell you all that we are appreciative of each and every single one of y'all who came here tonight and watched this stream. And on top of that, not only were 9.5 thousand of y'all here live, 85 thousand of y'all have watched this stream before it ended, which is incredible and i gotta thank y'all once again for being here with us supporting this channel and helping us to keep this thing running and of course just enjoying the news uh if you did enjoy and you were brand new which many of y'all probably were i would highly encourage y'all to uh subscribe because if you subscribe it makes us happy and two it might notify you it might uh that we're running our streams and our videos because we put out a short war video almost every single day uh and we also on top of that put out these live streams every day of the week except for monday at the exact same time every single night so you can always count on us to be here covering the news on stream and you can also largely count on us to be covering it in video form as well but with that it is time for us to end good night good luck take care stay safe slum ukraini and long live the least spring army the least spring army will never die and good night, folks, and be sure to join me tomorrow evening for our short war update video coming out midday and also our stream again once again tomorrow at 10 p.m. Eastern. So thank you for another great stream, and of course, Slav Ukraine, Hiram Slava, and good night. Get some rest.